then you jump into our 5.0 and the low light sensor on that thing is ridiculous. We were out uh, testing it with some, we were out setting trail cameras actually on one of Jeff's hunting properties. And uh, there were some deer out in the field. They're about 50 or 60 yards away from us. And it was getting to the point where you're kind of seeing silhouettes, you know, more than anything with your naked eye. We got home and we were just playing with the cameras, kind of seeing what they would do. We get home, we plug them into the computer and we're watching and the camera was actually picking up more light than our eyes were, which was pretty, pretty wow. darn outstanding, especially for a point of view. Yeah. So with my 5.0, I don't think I'd question its ability to get you out past legal shooting time. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 262, Aaron Stonehawker, Tacticam, Hunt Tech, part two. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Rackology. Everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts or online at www.rackology.org. Hunters blend coffee, defending hunting one cup at a time. Finally, there's a coffee that helps rather than hurts your freedom to hunt. Use the code BBR to receive 10% off your next Hunters Blend order. Polar Works Coolers and the Chill Zone, specializing in the most durable, reliable thermal cups and coolers. Keep your drinks hot or cold in any element. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. And Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies. And show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Jake Bennett from Boston Bowhunter, and you're listening to the best Big Buck podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Hey, this is John Livingston from Deer Lab, and you're about to listen to one of my favorite all-time podcasts, the Big Buck Registry. Hey, this is Zach Sandow at Onyx Hunt, and you're listening to one of my personal favorite podcasts, the Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes, subscribe, and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. On the last episode of Deer Hunt, we began our exploration of hunting technology with the Drury's new app called DeerCast. We continue our series on hunting technology in this episode with the likes of Tacticam, a company who built what is perhaps the best deer hunting action camera on the market. We've all been involved in hunts where we wished we had a camera to film at all, but didn't. And there's that occasion when we did have a camera, but the awkwardness of using the camera and taking the shot at the same time made for terrible footage. There have been other action cameras on the market, but somehow this small company out of Minnesota has gotten top marks with hunters, probably because they thought through what the hunter needs most. A camera that can seemingly just be part of the equipment, conveniently hidden near the end of a barrel or within the stabilizer of a bow, and without duct tape, and can be activated with the push of a button. Tacticam continues to reach new ground as it constantly attempts to increase the quality of the video with the likes of Tacticam 5.0, but has never compromised for those hunters on a budget, for example, with the Tacticam Solo. Stay with us as we explore all aspects of Tacticam on the show with the likes of Aaron Stonehawker.
and stay tuned for next week when we explore some more technology with John Livingston from Deer Lab. We'll get to our entire interview with Aaron Stonehawker from Tacticam in just one moment, but before we do, let's hear from our friends at Rackology, Polar Works Coolers, and Jim Keller with the Deer News. I still can't believe that's all you're taking. I got everything I need all in one bag. Rackology Deer Supplement and Attractant, developed through years of intense scientific research, comes a product that puts it all in one bag. Superior Attractant, scientifically formulated vitamins and minerals, and all at a much better price. To get yours today, please check out Rackology.org for a list of dealers. Rackology, how can you afford not to use it? Everything deer need, all in one bag. I always wanted one of those high-end coolers because of the quality that I had heard of, but I couldn't justify the price. Then I found Polar Works. Finally, I found a company that understands quality and affordability. The Polar Works lineup is extensive and is filled with Polar Cups, Polar Tubs, and Polar Soft Coolers. So check out PolarWorks.com when you're considering your next high-quality cooler without breaking the bank. That's www.polarworkz.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week. After decades of debate, tracking dogs can now be used in Pennsylvania to find wounded deer, bear, and elk. This story is from the LancasterOnline.com website and was written by Ad Crable. For the first time in more than a century, deer hunters in Pennsylvania this fall are able to recover their shot deer by using a tracking dog. The General Assembly approved a dog tracking legislation for big game species this spring and archery hunters who are now hunting deer are the first who can use dogs. Game that can now be tracked by dogs are deer, bear, and elk. The legislation, which has gone through a number of modifications and regulation changes during decades of debate, requires that any dog used to track wounded or lost game be on a leash and can't go onto private property without permission. The law also requires that the big game being tracked have been shot by a hunter. The hunter who has shot the game may carry a firearm to dispatch the animal if found, but not at night, on Sundays, or after legal, regular hunting hours. Nor can the game be shot the day after a hunting season closes for that species. It's something that hunters have pushed for for two decades as a humane, common-sense step to prevent game from being wasted. At least 23 other states have approved dog tracking of game in the last 30 years. In eight southern states, it was never illegal. However, in Pennsylvania, the idea encountered some pushback. The use of dogs to hunt game was outlawed in the early 1900s during the days of widespread hunting for commercial purposes. Initially, the Game Commission refused to back the use of dogs to track wounded game because the agency didn't want to take on licensing and regulations. But licensing requirements were dropped. Essentially, anyone can be a tracker if he or she has a dog and hunting license for the species being pursued. Trackers can charge for their services. It's between the hunter and tracker to make arrangements. However, since commercial activity is not allowed on game lands, any tracking done on game lands must be free. Hunters may find a list of trackers by using an interactive map provided by the United Blood Trackers Group. Bovine tuberculosis in Michigan deer, not a concern in Missouri or Kansas, experts say. This story is from the fox4kc.com website. Michigan officials are warning hunters about bovine tuberculosis found in deer, but Missouri and Kansas officials want local hunters to know it's not something they need to worry about. Bovine tuberculosis was recently confirmed in a large cattle herd in Alcona County, Michigan, making it the 73rd cattle herd in the state to be identified with the bacterial disease since 1998. Bovine TB attacks the respiratory system of animals, usually cattle and deer, creating bubbles and white spots near the rib cage. The disease is a problem in Michigan and Minnesota due to the state's wetter climates, but both Kansas Department of Wildlife and Tourism and the Missouri Department of Conservation said it's not a problem there. There haven't been any cases of bovine tuberculosis in recent Kansas or Missouri history, and Missouri officials even said there has never been a case in deer. So while Michigan hunters should be on the lookout when hunting this fall, Missouri and Kansas hunters should be fine. Of course, both state agencies say if a Missouri or Kansas hunter sees bubbles or white spots in a deer's rib cage or lungs, they should report it. But it will likely be a parasite or some other problem, not bovine tuberculosis. Big game hunter and former beauty queen faces backlash after claiming hobby helps with conservation. This story is from the Fox News website. A big game hunter and former beauty queen is facing backlash after she claimed in a television interview that hunting helps with anti-poaching and conservation efforts. Olivia Nelos Opre, 
who won the title of Miss Nebraska in 2003, spoke about her hobby on the UK-based show this morning via Satellite Wednesday from her home in Montana. The mother of four told host Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby she's killed about 100 species of animals in six different countries. Her Facebook bio says she's hunted in Benin, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Argentina, Mongolia, France, Spain, Romania, New Zealand, Mexico, Canada, and throughout the United States. She also discussed her belief that hunters are the ones that are giving so much back to preserving the wild species. Oprah also claimed that organizations like Safari Club International fund research in hunting areas to make sure the numbers are sustainable. Big game hunters such as Oprah often receive harsh backlash, especially online, when they share images of their quote-unquote trophies. Earlier this week, a fellow big game hunter and friend of Oprah's, Brittany, was shamed online for killing a leopard in Namibia. The photo of Longoria holding the carcass of the big cat went viral after it was posted on Instagram by David Bonavier, co-founder of Not On My Planet, an organization that works to end elephant po- ivory poaching. It was later shared by many others, including celebrities like Naomi Campbell, Doubtson Crows, and Kyle Richards, all of whom expressed their disapproval of Longoria's hobby. Oprah has also been the focus of social media backlash, with commenters calling her vile and evil, among other insults. There's a huge difference between hunting and poaching, and what hunters are doing is legal. So when you have a death threats on somebody who has done something legal, it's extremely frustrating, she said. Deer fight goes viral after images of stags locked in battle emerge. This story is from the Fox News website. Images of a fight between two male deer went viral after the stags locked horns and wouldn't unlock them for about two hours. Approximately 200 images were captured by wildlife photographer Ingo Gerlach, who watched the action unfold in the Sauerland Forest, Germany, SWNS reports. But after the clash went on for more than 20 minutes, Gerlach ventured closer, noting it was an extremely hard fight. The two stags were evenly matched with no clear-cut winner. He added that both stags were totally exhausted and had their tongues hanging out with sweaty fur. Stags will fight each other for a variety of reasons, including an increase in testosterone, increased aggression, and during breeding season. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum for leads on some of the stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Aaron Stonehawker from Tacticam. Aaron Stonehawker, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Doing well, Jay. Thanks for having me. I'm psyched to talk to you because Tacticam is uh, is a cool product, and uh, I've seen it everywhere. I'm fascinated by its advancement and where it's come from and how far it's gotten in the industry. And Mm -hmm. I felt that it was time to break it down some more to learn about you, the company, the products you offer, all the the nuances of the product themselves and make it part of our technology hunting series. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's a great fit. Very nice. So, Aaron, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Where do you call home now? Yeah, so uh, that's a little bit longer story for me, Um, having a military background. But we, uh, both my wife and I were both born and raised in Iowa. Um, Central Iowa is where I'm from. It's where I grew up doing most of my deer hunting, uh, learning how to hunt, all that good stuff. And then uh, turned 21 and joined the Air Force, went to basic training down in Texas and tech school down there. And I was a weapons loader um, out of the Iowa Air National Guard. And then my wife commissioned out of the University of Iowa to be active duty Air Force as a nurse. I got a nursing degree there and our first, her first duty station uh, was in Langley, Virginia, uh, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. So um, that drug us out there and I wrapped up my Air Force career, my final two years out there. And uh, I was a park ranger actually uh, for two years in Iowa as my civilian career and then three years out in Virginia. I loved every second of that. Um, just Virginia is a beautiful place, uh, but I had to get used to the deer being a heck of a lot smaller than they are in Iowa. I know that. <laughs> the uh, the first hunt that I went on out there, actually, it was a uh, muzzleloader season. And, um, I was laying out there just, I, I actually had belly crawled through some switch grass and was laying on this edge of a bean field that i have been seeing deer every night. And I got permission from the landowner to be out there and, uh, I'm sitting there watching and those just start filtering out in this field. And at that point I was, I was meat hunting. I didn't care what stepped out. I was 
hoping a buck might, but uh, anyway, long story short on that, I laid there for about three hours watching 50 deer out there in this field, and I could not decide to shoot one because they all look tiny, and I'm like, man, these <laughs> I can't believe I'm seeing this many two-year-old deer or, or younger filtering out in this field. There's no big ones, you know, even mature does or anything, so I called the landowner on the way home, and he was like, dude, you should have shot any one of those things. He said, that's about as big as they get, so, huh. um, you know, I think the biggest deer I shot in Virginia was... Uh, the biggest deer I shot was probably 120 pounds, maybe. Um, so yeah, they're, they're definitely a lot smaller species, but anyway, so now we're, uh, we did four years out there, did a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting, um, met a lot of great, you know, uh, lifelong friends now, um, that I'd love to go back and hunt with and do all that stuff. And, uh, now we're actually living up here in Great Falls, Montana. She got restationed up here at Malmstrom Air Force Base, uh, in between what are there and, and here, um, Obviously, now I work for Tacticam full-time, so um, I'm the communications director for them, which is nice because I can move anywhere and do it. Uh, I don't really have to worry about, you know, looking for a new job or starting over in my career as a park ranger, you know, every time we move. So uh, this travels with me. Uh, obviously, I'm a hunter diehard, and, uh, you know, just being able to work in the hunting industry was a pretty cool opportunity, and uh, for this company, it was an even better opportunity, so I really couldn't turn it down. So. Right, right. That's where we're at today. Gotcha. Do you remember your earliest um, hunting experience, or do you re- recall that? Oh, yeah. I don't know if anyone forgets that, do they? I don't think no, they I... do, but uh, <laughs> it's always a good question to ask. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so I kind of got myself into hunting a little bit. My dad, uh, we went out pheasant hunting, you know, in, in Iowa. You can kind of gravel travel or and you pretty much drive gravel roads and, and look for birds that are in the road ditches and stuff like that. We did that a, a handful of times. We'd go mushroom hunting, but I really never got any uh, big game experience or, or even small game for that matter. For the most part, when I was growing up, I just kind of, like, it was just in me, I guess. So um, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of research through the hunting channels on TV. I could probably tell you when I was eight or nine years old, every single show that was going to come on at what time. Cause I just, every day I was watching them and trying to learn everything I could from TV. And, uh, no, I got into bow hunting, I think, when I was for deer. Um, I think I was 13, 13 or 14. And, uh, yeah, I just went out and I shot my bow every single day. Just kept, you know, trying to get myself better and better at being more accurate. And um, Then I had a, a, a family friend of ours actually took me out on my very first ever deer hunt. And, um, yeah, we were sitting in a ground blind in just a small town over from where I grew up. And uh, he, I remember very vividly, he had taken a two bottles, two entire bottles or those little three ounce bottles, whatever they are of tank 69. And, uh, and I didn't know much about, you know, sense and stuff at the time I was more, you know, focused on just the hunt itself. And he takes two of those bottles and he just douses the entire top of the blind with it, pours it all over <laughs> around the, <laughs> around the edge of the blind. And it, I think he was trying to use it as a cover scent, but anyway, I mean, the, the whole blind just stunk and we're sitting inside and it's a hot day, like right, right. As soon as bow season open. And he's got one of those, I mean, the camera probably weighed 10 pounds. It was one of those old, you know, recorded uh, video recorders. And um, all of a sudden he's looking out the back of the blind. He's like, Aaron, he's like, get ready. Here comes some deer. And I'm like, okay. You know, so I get my bow ready and the adrenaline starts. And uh, I kind of look out the side of the blind and there's a train of bucks just walking. And I was, I just, I locked onto the first one that I could see. And I'm like, oh man, that's a buck. It's got horns. My first deer is going to be a buck. This is going to be so cool. And it gets out in front of the blind and I go to, to full draw and, and let the pin fly. I think it was about, or let the arrow fly. It was about 10 or 15 yards, I think from the blind and the deer took off running and all the, just everywhere deer just took off running and it was pretty crazy. And he said, what'd you shoot the small one for? And I said, what do you mean? He said, dude, there was a 10 pointer coming in the back. I was going to tell you to wait, but I thought you were waiting because he was filming out the back of the blind as they were coming. Right, right. And uh, anyway, so we, we go do the whole blood trail and I think the deer went, probably it went a little bit further than what I would have expected for the shot, but it, it was about 150 yard track, just, you know, blood everywhere. It was good. Any nice, easy one through some switchgrass. And, uh, yeah, so my first buck was a five point had three, three antlers or three tips on one side. And then, uh, it's other side was just a fork and it was actually like broken off in the skull. So there was no skin broken or anything, but the antler was like laying there limp. One of them was, so it was, I don't know if he got in a big fight or what, but gotcha. you know, so we did the, the little post interview with the, video camera and i thanked all my product sponsors in the whole nine yards so it was uh it was pretty cool but yeah that was my first bow hunt and then you know i my first gun hunt was with my dad and 
same exact thing. I ended up shooting a little buck because I was so excited. And he said, dude, a 15 point came running out by me as soon as you started shooting. So <laughs> just uh, <laughs> jump in the gun a little bit. Gotcha. Oh, you were excited. You know, that's the way it goes. Yeah. And so- What's interesting to me, and I, I guess there's some irony here, is that 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 you know earliest recollection was was filmed, um, and, and <laughs> yeah, now, now yeah. you're like in, you're like thick into the working for a company that does nothing <laughs> but that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A little bit of foreshadowing on that. Right, right. Very interesting. So, how did you get involved with Tacticam? What? How did you get a job working for this, yeah. this company? So it's kind of a long, uh, a little bit of a long process. It kind of started back in Iowa. Um, so I used to do, uh, it was all kind of random. So I had, a, I had a buddy in college. He was actually a, a buddy of mine in the National Guard. We worked in the same shop. And then he happened to go to school up there with me in Cedar Rapids. Um, or like his last semester, we kind of overlapped. But anyway, I got in touch with him. And he started doing some graphic design work for a couple magazines. And one of them, uh, I believe was called pure hunting magazine. I don't think it's around anymore. Um, and he just, he got a hold of me one day cause he knew I loved to hunt and fish and all that. And he said, Hey dude, he said, I need 1200 words to fill up a page. Um, you know, I know you just, and I, at the time I was kind of dabbling with maybe the idea of starting my own hunting TV show. Obviously I love to hunt. I'd gotten out there. I'd started, you know, getting a few low end cameras here and there trying to figure out the hunting thing or the filming thing. And he goes, and I'd started a Facebook page for that called Light the Fire Outdoors, which was hopefully the name of the show I was going to start. So anyway, uh, he's like, I don't care if you tell a story about that, uh, tell a hunt story, whatever. Just if you can fill 1,200 words, man, we'll get you, you know, an article in this magazine. So I, I end up writing the story of kind of, uh, um, kind of where I think the hunting passion started with me, uh, which. I remember growing up at my grandpa's house. We were over at my grandparents' house all the time on my mom's side, and. Uh, you know, he only had, I think, one or two hunting stories ever, you know, in his, you know, back in the days when Iowa first opened the first deer season, he remembers all that. But he always had an, a beautiful 11 point rack hanging in the garage. And I would just, I think part of his stories and just looking at that deer rack is kind of where the hunting thing started with me. So I wrote a story a little bit about how my fire got started with the outdoors and it got published in the magazine. I thought it was pretty neat. You know, I've got the magazine still here in my office and, um, Anyway, so then we we kind of went through that whole transition and moved out to or right before we moved to Virginia. Sorry, uh, that summer I used to do competitive weightlifting as well. Hmm. So I was doing the bench press competition at the Iowa State Fair, and so you you lift, you do your three lifts, and then uh, you know they wait for the rest of the day for everybody else to go through and tally the scores and all that. So I was walking around with my parents, and we happened to just walk through one of the the industry buildings there. And my mom saw the Iowa Sportsman magazine booth, and she's like, "Oh, Aaron, hey, you should go check out that magazine and tell them about your." Uh, you know, your article, because she obviously, as any mom would be, she's uh, super proud that her, you know, her, her boy got a, an article published. It was right. the coolest <laughs> thing for her. So yeah. anyway, she just, and I'm like, no, mom, that's fine. And she, of course, starts dragging me over there. It's like, no, we're going to go tell him. And so she, she's telling them all about how I'm this published writer and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. And, uh, and anyway, the guy was like, well, dude, he's like, you know, uh, we're always looking for new writers, you know, like, what do you do? Like, what do you hunt for? What do you fish for all that? And so I told him pretty much anything and everything and told him the story about that article. And he's like, yeah, man, he's like, we're always looking for new writers. Um, and I told him about like the fire outdoors and, uh, he goes, yeah, here's a, here's the business card information for, uh, the editor of this magazine. And then, uh, he, um, so he's like, dude, you like to film your hunts? He said, you need to check out this new product. He said, they just started advertising with us. He grabbed one of his sample magazines there and flipped open to the page. that had a Tacticam ad in it. And I'd never heard of him at the time, but I, I was literally, I had the money saved up and I had, was just kind of in that final research stage of, of actually buying some of our competitors' cameras and, uh, you know, all the mounts that I thought I would need to try to make that happen and, and some other stuff. And it was a pretty good chunk of change that I was ready to spend on some cameras. And then I saw this. And just looking at it, the design of the camera, I'm like, okay, I already like that better. It looks like it's going to fit way better on my equipment and all the mounts that they were advertising in there. They made, were made to go on your weapon. I'm like, dude, this thing look, looks really cool, but I'll do my research, you know? So, and then, uh, anyway, we, uh, we head out and, uh, we ended up moving out to Virginia before I, you know, really thought much more about it. Uh, you know, with moving expenses up, I kind of put the cameras on hold on buying those, well, when I get out there and I was finishing up my bachelor's degree at the time one day and I was, you know, bored and procrastinating some paper or something. So I just started Googling Tacticam and I, I started watching some videos that were out and they looked really good. I liked how, you know, the side by side comparisons of any of the competitors that they would compare it against 
the footage is so much closer and all that. And I'm like, man, this has got to be the ticket. So I actually called the customer service line. Just to, I, I had a few questions. I can't even remember what they were now about the cameras just to kind of finalize my purchase decision. And uh, uh, Ben Stern, and he's the guy who actually invented the camera, but I didn't know it at the time. He picks up the phone on the customer service line. We're, we're talking and he's answering all my questions. And uh, at the end of it, I said, well, I said, I know you guys are a new company. I said, Can you tell me a little bit about yourself. I said, are you, you know, just you work in customer service or, you know, what do you do? And he's like, oh, no, man, I actually invented that camera. And I'm like, get out of here. There's no way I'm talking to the guy who invented the camera on the customer service line. And um, he goes, yeah, yeah. So I said, oh, now you got to tell me your story. So he kind of told me the whole backstory, the, the, you know, where he is now, where he was when he started and the original camera, the whole nine yards. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. And then a week later, I called back. I I thought of one more question to ask, and uh, Jeff Peel answered the phone, and I didn't know who he was either. And same thing, you know, I thought he was customer service, and he ends up telling me, no, man, I'm the CEO of the company. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I said, just take my money, you know, at this point. um, You know, I like your cameras. I can't believe I've talked to the CEO and the the guy who started the company in the first two phone calls I've ever made to him. So, uh, you know, no matter what, I'm sold at this point. So. I get my first camera. Um, and then about a month after that, you know, I, I got out, did some filming, you know, I was dabbling with the backyard. I mounted it to my lawnmower to kind of you know, test the, the vibration of use it could take and mounted it to my dog and anything I could mount that thing to. I was mounting it to just getting random footage. And then a month later, I get a call from a gentleman they had working for him at the time. And he told me to check my email and they were just started up a pro staff program. Um, and he had a, he had a, you know, welcome to the Tacticams pro staff uh, you know, acceptance letter in there. So I went in and did that for a little bit, got on their pro staff. That was exciting. Um, and then, uh, I learned really quickly how hunting in Virginia is a lot different than hunting in Iowa and, and, uh, you know, learning all these new places, it can be tough. And I really didn't get much, uh, much hunting footage really. And so I kind of felt bad. I just joined this pro staff and stuff. So I just started taking the camera around to my local bow shops that I was shooting league in and all that, and just trying to get people excited about it. Like I was, and, uh, you know, just trying to get, you know, if anything else, I could just promote it that way. So, um, you know, kind of did that for, I suppose, about a year. And then, uh, well, you know, one thing kind of led to another out there. And, uh, you know, I was obviously progressing in my uh, park ranger career out there and that was going well. And um, Jeff Peel randomly got a hold of me one day and and I had volunteered a couple of times to work a couple of trade shows. I know you've probably been to the Harrisburg show in Pennsylvania. It's yes, probably one yeah. of the biggest in the country. And uh, I went up there a couple of times to help him out, just anything I could. I was trying to help him out, you know, and just, I loved the product and I, w- I knew it was a small company. I wanted to help him any way I could. So uh, Jeff got a hold of me one day and he said, look, man, you've been around, you know, we've, we've had this program out for a year. Uh, you've been on it. You've always been out there kind of going above and beyond doing these different things. What would, what would you think about if you could run a pro staff program for us? He just kind of laid a couple of guidelines out there, you know, like, what would you do with it? how would you run it? Uh, what ideas would you have? And, you know, how would you just make it work? And, um, and he told me that just, you know, put something together in an email, shoot it to me. We'll, we'll re- revisit it in about a week or two. So what ended up starting as just a, an email turned into this big 13 page report thing of, uh, I just compiled all these ideas and tried to organize the structure of it. And I sent that up to him. Well, I didn't hear back from him for about a month. Hmm. And finally I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. So I called one of my other friends that I'd met while working at the Harrisburg show that worked for the company. Uh, Frank Lemus is his name. Uh, he's a retired army guy. Um, he's a, he's a really cool dude. But anyway, I got a hold of him and I said, look, you know, I don't want to push, you know, anything right now. I don't know Jeff all that well. I've never officially met him, but I said, here's the deal. Here's where we're at. And I said, I'm kind of getting a little you know, antsy because it got me excited, but you know, is it okay to call him? Should I just wait? He's like, no, dude. He's like, Jeff's so busy. He said, if you don't knock his door down, he said, you will not get a hold of him. So he said, don't worry about it. He said, if he gives you any grief, tell him Frank said so. So uh, I called him back and I, I think I called him two or three times that next week, just, you know, periodically. And finally he answered one of the time. He's like, oh man, he said, I haven't been ignoring you. He said, we've been so busy. He said, I saw that <laughs> that thing was 13 pages. He said, I didn't have the time to, to go through it yet, but let's sit down tonight and go through it. And so he kind of we bounced some more ideas off each other and we kind of went back and forth for a few more months. And then he, you know, at the end of the day, um, I just don't know if he was a hundred percent sold on the idea of kind of where we were going with it, or maybe that they were quite ready for the direction that we got it now. Um, so we hung it on the shelf and it, it took about a year, uh, to get back. And, um, and Jeff called me one day and he said, you know what, Aaron, he said, you've, uh, you know, I, I was a little 
I kind of wanted to watch you a little bit and see how you reacted because I know you'd worked really hard on this and you got your hopes up for it, but you never changed your attitude. You kept out there. I really respect that. And he said, well, how would you like to put all that stuff into motion and just do it part time? He said, do you have time to do that? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So um, after work, uh, I would make phone calls and start recruiting team members. And, um, you know, my drive home, I had about an hour drive back and forth. Uh, there in Virginia between the park and, and my home. And uh, so every night I'd make phone calls and interview people and get them signed up for the team and get them excited. And um, and then eventually, I think two or three months later, he got a hold of me again and said, you know, hey, if we're going to do this, we got to do it right. And I need you. I need you on full time if you can do it. And so um, thought about it a little bit, talked about it with the wife and, you know, thought it was a good direction. Uh, you know, one of those opportunities, I think I'd kick myself all over the place if I never jumped on it. So um I just put in my two weeks at the park and uh, now we're now I'm working for tax cam and I've been here about a year, year and a half, I suppose. I think it was a year in May is when I started. So gotcha. yeah, we're getting okay. almost two years. Yep. No kidding. So speaking of the, the history of the company or your initial, uh, you made a couple of calls. You talked to the, the inventor of the camera, then you talked to the CEO. They must've <laughs> yeah. had some roots, right. In the, in the origins of Tacticam. Can you uh, tell us oh, a little man. bit how these, this whole camera concept got started? Yeah. So Ben Stern, he's a, uh, just a small town guy, life of the party guy out of Holman, Wisconsin. He, uh, he just, he'd gotten into hunting. I think he'd been hunting his whole life. You know, his whole family is a bunch of hunters. Um, and just one of those things where he, he's kind of a tech guy anyway. Uh, I think most people would classify him as probably the nerd of the, the people who own the company. He's the nerd of the group, the gotcha. super tech savvy, he's super creative. And, uh, you know, one day he was just dabbling around and he just, he knew people from college and stuff that could do different things and, and knew how to make different parts of, of cameras and whatever. And, uh, his background's actually in photography. So he knows his way around a camera pretty well. And, um, yeah, he just, he was out hunting one day. I said, look, you know, I, I want to start filming these things or figure out a way I can film it from my weapon to just share my memories out in the field. And so he just started, you know, getting a hold of some of his contacts and putting pieces together. And uh, the original camera is actually, it's a microchip, a camera lens, a vibrate motor, and, uh, and an LED light. And it's all like uh, medically taped together. So, <laughs> and he, he still has it today. And it's the coolest thing when you look at it, it has no casing on or anything, but he used to take that on his bow until he could get it, you know, tweak this, tweak that. And he eventually got it the way he wanted. And so he decided to take his idea to the next level and actually turn it into what's now the, uh, the tax cam 2.0 kind of design. There was a little bit of tweaks they made to it to make it the 2.0, but essentially it was a metal housing, about a three and a half ounce camera like it is today, super light. And it was made of aluminum at the time. It was waterproof down to like 90 feet. Um, and just, he got it to, to where he, you know, they could start selling them. He got a business partner and then, uh, you know, fast forward a few months and insert Jeff Peel at a trade show, him and uh, Tara Peel, his wife, Jeff's now the CEO of the company. Um, they met Ben at a trade show. They loved the idea of the camera. Uh, you know, Ben was kind of in, a situation for, from a business perspective that he could, you know, really use some help. Otherwise I don't think you guys would even know about Tacticam today if Jeff had never, uh, you know, Jeff and Ben's past had never met and right, uh, they right. did, which is a good thing. And Jeff kind of took it over and man, everything's just escalated like crazy. But, uh, I think the coolest thing about, you know, this idea in this company is knowing like Jeff and Tara and Ben, uh, essentially lived at a, you know, during trade show season, which for any outdoors enthusiasts out there, you know, is, Usually January 1st through about the end of May is just crazy trade show season. The industry's, you know, traveling all over the place, trying to get their customers, the products in hand. And, uh, but anyway, these guys would just pull a trailer with them and they'd travel from trade show to trade show to trade show with boxes of camera parts at night. They would build cameras. Um, they'd build so many to bring to the show that day. They'd fill any online orders that had happened by building the cameras, packaging them and dropping them off to the, the post office on the way to the trade show the next day. And, and that was you know, two years of that company is literally just all hands on deck, building cameras to all hours of the night and, and making it happen. So, um, you know, just definitely, like you said, from the ground up, everybody that's at Tacticam today has got, a, you know, some kind of, you know, messy hands, so to speak. You know, they've all put the blood, sweat and tears into it. And, and now it's starting to get really cool. People really are starting to recognize the brand. The camera has come light years from where it was. Um, you know, now they got the 4K resolution, eight times zoom. You can, it's got a remote control that you can just like your TV, your TV's off, the remote's off, but you can turn them both on at the same time. It's just 
uh, it's getting crazy. So I think, uh, and there's a lot of cool things that are still in the books that I can't probably talk about without Jeff firing me. So, <laughs> so stay tuned on some of them because it'll be pretty neat. Right, good things to come. Well, it sounds like, you know, it was a grassroots kind of start them up kind of thing where you or the company, it's almost like the, the band selling DVD or not DVDs, the band selling CDs out of the back <laughs> of their, their car yeah. uh, on the street, trying to get things to go. And it, and it worked. It was, it's one of those it, things. Exactly. Gotcha. Yep. Awesome. It's a great product. Um, let's, uh, if we could, let's start breaking down some of the, the, the products that you have at Tacticam, the different cameras and what, mm -hmm. what each of them do and some of the other products that you have to offer. Yeah. So, uh, the, the company has been around for about four and a half years for the first two years of that. Um, you know, a lot of customers out there still have them. I've still got mine. Uh, the Tacticam 2.0 was the name of the game. It was really the only camera out there that could do what it could do. And it still is today. Tacticam is for hunters. Um, but you know, like I said, it was a metal camera and it was waterproof down to 90 feet, just one button on top. That's all you hit. You hit the button one time, turns on and starts recording. That's the whole premise behind Tacticam. It's super simple to use. You press the button one time and you're going to get your hunt on film right. as long as you can keep the camera pointed at what you're shooting at. So quick, it's quick, um, quick activation kind of thing. Cause in the moment, yeah. you, we all know in the moment, you don't really have time to, to think. Um, but if all you have to do is push one button and, I, and this is funny because I, I frequently see this, I, you see somebody dragging a, a nice deer out and then you take a look and you're like, <laughs> you have a tactic cam on that bow. Yeah, I do. Did you push the button? Oh, I forgot. Yeah. I forgot. Yep. <laughs> Good. If you if you're at a trade show with me at all, I, I tell everybody that as long as you can remember to hit the button, you're going to get your hunt on. Film. Right. Right. It happens. The, yep. It does. And like you said, the heat of the moment, you know, and everybody's a hunter first, which really is why Tacticam is such a cool thing for the average Joe. For I mean, heck, Lee and Tiffany are probably the biggest stars in the industry. They use them uh, and they love it because it's it's so easy. It's so light. You don't even know it's there. Uh, it kind of, as long as, again, if you can train yourself to just reach up and hit that button, uh, it's that simple to get right. your hunt on film. Right. And now, you know, we've, we've progressed to the, uh, they, when they came out with the new product design, which is what is now the Tacticam 4.0, um, they revisited the housing. They, uh, you know, due to patents and stuff, they actually started switching some pieces around. Uh, so now everything is proprietary to Tacticam there. Um, which is pretty neat. The, the housing, um, we walked away from the metal and went into a polymer housing because of the, uh, you know, just to eliminate any kind of extra noise that might be there, you know, sliding the camera in and out of the stabilizer mount, you have a little bit of metal on metal contact with the old camera. Now you don't have it. Um, it's like coated in kind of a rubber material. So you don't have to worry about gripping it. All the mounts are, you don't have to tighten them very tight because of that grip that's on the camera itself. Uh, the camera's not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about the camera slipping or anything. Um, and uh, they're a little bit lighter now. They're about 3.3 ounces, again, which is nothing a hunter's going to notice on his weapon. Um, but what they did is they, they came out with a 3 and a 4.0, um, and that was a test run for the market. The 4.0 had the built-in Wi-Fi antenna. The 3.0 did not, and it was, again, just to test the market. The 4.0 sold like 4 or 5 to 1 over the 3s, and now we just have the 4.0. So um, the 4.0 camera, it's got your five time zoom, 2.7 K max resolution. It's got a slow motion mode built in there. So on top of the camera, you're going to see two buttons. One's your power button, same exact concept. You hit the button one time camera comes on and start recording. And then you've got your mode button in the back that allows you to switch between the 2.7 K resolution and a three time zoom, uh, five time zoom at 1080p resolution. Then your slow motion on the 4.0 is a built in at 720p at 120 frames a second. And then this year, uh, the cream of the crop that has come out now is our Tacticam 5.0 series. Uh, you will love the 4.0. I've, I've got two or three of them that I still run. Um, I've got a couple fives now, but the, the, what the five can do, you know, for the tech guy, it's going to be great. You can actually customize any of the modes that you want. Still got three modes in it, but I can custom set them to whatever zoom I want up to eight time zoom now. Uh, up to 4K resolution and uh, slow motion actually has two different uh, frame rates. You've got 240 for super slow mo and 120 for just your regular slow mo. Um, and then it's got the Tacticam 5.0 remote, which, like I said, you know, there's a lot of cameras out there, and uh, a lot of our customers are saying, "Man, if you just had a remote, you know, that'd really sell me." And so we came out with it this year. But the coolest thing about Tacticam's remote system is that it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't take the camera being on and the remote being synced up with some sort of a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi effect for the camera and the remote to work together. And almost every other camera you've got out there, you have to 
you know, turn the camera on, connect the remote, then the remote and the camera are sucking batteries like crazy. And it's just not effective for the hunter. So this allows you to turn on up to five cameras the exact same way you would normally turn on your, your tactic cam. You just push the remote button one time, any of those five cameras that are synced to the remote at that time, turn on and automatically start recording. So, you know, this makes it even cooler for the guy. Like for me, I've got uh, a wide angle lens that we came out with this year as well. I, that one's built more around the fishing aspect, gives you a little bit wider field of view for seeing the whole boat. I love it for kayak fishing. I can see on both sides of the boat when I'm reeling in fish, I don't really have to worry about turning my head too much. Um, but also that selfie angle, being able to point a camera back at you to capture your expression. Um, and then having my regular lens camera with my eight time zoom or whatever mode I have it in facing forward. I just hit the button in my pocket on the remote. Now both cameras come on. I don't have to do anything else. So I can just, you know, strap my release up and, and hopefully, uh, hit my target. So, gotcha. um, yep. Just some really cool stuff. The cameras are all completely weatherproof. You never have to worry about hunting in the pouring rain, which is a huge thing for guys that love getting out there and, and filming in any kind of weather, you know, other cameras, you've got to somehow enclose them or, you know, put a, put an umbrella over your tree, which can make all kinds of noise and things like that. This strap the camera on your bow. It doesn't matter what the weather throws at you that day. You're good to go. They've got a full microphone in them as well, which is actually of all the things these cameras can do for a point of view camera. That's probably my favorite feature is the fact that it has a microphone that doesn't require any extra accessory. doesn't require you to plug anything in and it captures audio like you want to believe uh it'll pick up turkeys goblin from my personal experience out to 200 yards um it'll pick up i had a deer actually a muzzleloader deer this year i actually ran out of camera light on it because i was back in the woods a little too far and i could hear the deer coming in i, I kept the video to this day um the deer comes in it, it starts walking in about 50 yards is where i can hear it and because i knew where it was coming on the trail and the camera's picking up his footsteps on pine needles all the way up underneath the tree until he walks out into the field. And then all you see on the, the video, cause the camera has an amazing low light sensor. It'll pick up any light that's available um, if it's dark. And all you see is the muzzle flash go off and then you hear the deer take off. So um, just a, it's a, it's a well-rounded camera. Like I said, the average Joe now can just put together some really cool videos, guys who are already filming for shows or YouTube channels, whatever. It's a great addition to that really makes it a more well-rounded feature. And they've got a second angle for everything. So, wow. All right. Really cool. So all, on your website, you've got four different cameras that are available mm -hmm. and I want to go through some of the features on each one, as you described um, just recently. So you've got the Tacticam solo, You've got mm -hmm. the Tacticam 4.0, you've got the Tacticam 5.0 wide lens, and then the Tacticam 5.0. Yeah. Now, each of these cameras are waterproof. Is that correct? So they are completely sealed. We rate them for weatherproof. The difference between, that's a, that's a very common question. I'm glad you asked me that. So okay. um, this camera is not going to get affected. Like, let's say, let's say we're out duck hunting, right? And we're setting decoys and I'm waist deep in water. I've got my gun over my shoulder and my gun slips off or something while I'm setting decoys. If that gun goes down, you know, pick the gun up, the camera strapped to it. It's not going to be affected at all by that. Um, I, when I kayak fish, I usually will keep an extra camera with me in my vest. And if I, you know, bring in a decent sized fish or, or just for some extra footage, I'll actually dunk it under the water about elbow deep and, uh, just bring the fish in right in front of the camera, or I'll let the fish go in front of the camera for some underwater footage. Wow. It will stand some of that. So, the camera's completely sealed. We don't rate these for waterproof because we switched to that polymer housing. Um, water pressures at, at depths and, and moving water, um, they can flex just about anything, and, and polymer especially. So you start getting too deep with it. You know, I would say anything deeper than three feet, you're starting to play with uh, with fire on it okay. um, to where the water pressure might affect that. It might cause a leak. You just don't want to get it wet. But the camera is weatherproof. It will, like I said, if it's pouring rain on you, um, I've done plenty of videos just while it's pouring, just setting the camera outside and letting them film a puddle or something just so people can see that, you know, the water droplets and things are actually nailing the camera, but yeah, the weather's never going to affect it. Um, light underwater use is, is fine. We don't recommend it, but, um, but yeah, it's not rated for waterproof because okay. of that reason it, it, it can flex. Yeah. Okay. All of them. Uh, and we'll get into some of the individual features on each of these in a sec, but so, so all of them are weather, weatherproof. Um, some underwater capacity, but not really strongly recommended for long periods of time or depths. And yes, sir. the, all of them have the quick action, one button push. Let's, let's get this on film now kind of yep. strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's get into some of the, the battery life. How does, how do you charge these things and how long do they last? 
Yeah, so the, the battery is going to last on any of our cameras. So our Solo all the way through the 5.0 series, um, all those batteries are two and a half hour battery life. It's a lithium ion rechargeable battery. So you don't really have to worry about, you can abuse them a little bit. They're not going to lose battery life on you, that kind of thing. Um, that two and a half hours is full record time. So you're, there's a couple things that go into that. Uh, the resolution that it's in, you know, the, the harder the camera's got to work, uh, is going to suck a little bit more battery, but it's also going to fill the SD card space. Um, so typically it's a two and a half hour or plus that amount for, for battery life. But again, that's if I press the record button on any of those cameras and I set it on a table or I forget the cameras on, it will record for a full two and a half hours or until the SD card fills up, at which point it'll just stop recording. Um, but for the Hunter, you know, we're filming everything from 30 seconds to five minute clips at a time, typically, as long as you remember to pause the camera. The camera's got an auto shut off feature after you can set to whatever time you want. I got mine set all to 10 minutes just because again, you never know, you know, just because that doe came in and walked off and the buck wasn't right there doesn't mean she, he's not going to come in in the next minute or so, you know, so um, just being able to reach up and, and hit it. So, yeah, they've got an auto shut off feature if they're paused two and a half hours full record time on the battery. They charge uh, through the camera or we do sell battery chargers as an accessory as well. So the cameras come with a battery charger. It's a micro USB mm-hmm. or a mini USB, sorry. Um, that's just like your cell phone. You plug the block in the wall, plug the other end of the camera and the battery will charge in the camera. It takes about uh, about three to four hours. If the camera's completely dead, the battery's dead, um, inside the camera, it will take about four hours to charge from completely dead all the way to full. Uh, you got to dumb down when you're, you know, feeding electricity through, you know, an electronic piece of equipment. You've got to kind of dumb it down a little bit, which is why it takes longer. The battery chargers will charge two batteries in about two hours if they're completely dead. So um, it's a nice accessory to have, especially if you're going to carry multiple batteries with you. Um, I always carry an extra battery with me in my pack. Uh, just again, I'd rather have an extra and be safe than sorry. But having said that, I always charge my camera before I go out. So I know it's a full battery and uh, I've never had to replace a battery on a single hunt. Uh, and again, a lot of times I'll go four, five, six, seven days, uh, depending on how many days are they're going consecutive without changing batteries, just because like I said, you're filming 30 seconds to five minutes at a time. It takes a long time to fill up two and a half hours of a battery. Right. Right. Okay. As, as far as the individual cameras are concerned, um, there we talked about there are four different ones. What's the solo cam or Tacticam solo all about? What's the purpose of that one? Yeah. So the Tacticam solo is, it's kind of your entry level camera. So, uh, you know, we wanted to have something because our camera is built for anyone to be able to share their hunt. That's the mission of the company. They want people out there capturing their memories and bringing them home to their family and friends. So it's a whole point of it. Um, you know, our, our 4.0 lineup, it retails at three twenty nine ninety nine. So that price point, you know, we recognize that maybe not it, maybe it's not a good fit for everybody, but it doesn't mean everybody shouldn't be able to have a camera that can get out there and do the job as well as Tacticam can. So they can still bring those memories home. So the Tacticam solo fits that bill. The price point's quite a bit lower. Um, at one ninety nine, we actually have a Tacticam Bone Collector Edition out as well that you'll be seeing a lot more of here in the future. Um, so the Tacticam Solo, just simple. It's like the two point but with it's the upgraded size and housing of the four point and five point So all the mounts now are compatible camera series wide. So it doesn't matter what camera you have, all your mounts are going to work on your cameras. Um, but it's one button on top. You just simply hit the button. Camera comes on. It starts recording. It's got a built-in 1080p resolution, three times zoom, no frills. You know, press the button again to pause it, press and hold to shut it off. So it's just your simple. Anybody that's going to be out there, whether you're maybe a waterfowl hunter or an upland hunter or a bow hunter who, you know, your longest shot's 30 yards, this camera is going to do everything you want it to do. It's got the full microphone. Um, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to be perfect for that guy who doesn't want to spend a lot of money but wants to get out there and film their hunts. And it's just, again, it's brainless. It's, it's one button. So yeah. the Tacticam solo fits, it fits the, uh, you know, the entry level camera. If you're looking to get involved and in getting to start filming your hunts, this camera is great for those guys. It's, it's kind of mind boggling that you have a microphone capacity in each one of these things and it's still, yeah. it's still weatherproof. You don't see that. You know, that's not a common mm-hmm. thing that you get in a camera. That, yeah, exactly. And you don't have to sacrifice any of the weatherproofing with it, which is the best part about that microphone. Because yeah, like you said, typically, you know, uh, a lot of other, you know, the companies that, you know, hunters try to use for point of view cameras and things like that. Uh, you've got to plug in an external mic if you want any kind of usable audio at all. And that just completely usually will throw out the, the concept of it being waterproof or, or weatherproof or whatever. So right. it's definitely a big factor. And 
moving on to the Tacticamp 4.0, that's the precursor to the 5. Mm-hmm. It's a step up from the Solo. What else does the Tacticamp 4.0 do? Yeah, so this is where you start getting into your bells and whistles. So, uh, like I said, the resolution on the uh, on the Solo was 1080p, and that's just built in. You don't have any options with it. On the Tacticam 4.0, you have three different resolution options. You've got you've actually got more than that, but I'll explain that in a second. So, um, you've got three different modes. Same concept that you push the button once, the camera's going to come on and start recording in whatever mode the camera's in. You have battery indicator lights now. You're also going to have a Wi-Fi indicator light on top of that uh, camera, and there's going to be a second button that you can adjust your modes with. So you turn the camera on, it you it gets recording, you press the button, it'll pause the camera, and then you can switch to the modes on the Tacticam 4.0. Uh, your green light is going to indicate that you're in your 2.7K resolution mode, so a pretty big upgrade from the uh, um, from the 1080p of the Tacticam Solo. Uh, just a quick snippet on... Um, on resolution, your your higher resolutions allow you to post edit things with a higher zoom rate before they get kind of grainy. So if you're going to be, you know, doing a lot of post editing work, stuff like that, that high resolution is kind of important for that. But at the end of the day, any HD channel for the most part that you watch on TV is in 1080. So okay. that 1080 is going to be a solid setting. Um, it'll also get up more SD card space, the higher resolution you have. So you do have 2.7 K resolution. That mode is in three time zoom. So for three times zoom, what I like to tell people, just if you look out your backyard window or whatever, um, anything from five feet to a thousand yards is going to look exactly how your eyes see it. That's what the three times zoom concept is. Okay. Um, and then you have another mode. So I, it's a purple or a dark blue button, whatever your eyes see. Uh, so you hit the button one time, it'll switch modes on you. The, uh, the dark blue mode is going to be your five times zoom. So now, you know, for guys who want to shoot 50 yards, 70 yards, hundred yards, that five times zoom brings that target that much closer. So that video is a little bit more usable for you. Um, just, I mean, even with the naked eye, you know, something standing at hundred yards is pretty small. And the whole premise behind Tacticam is it, it sees what your eyes see versus pushing the target away. But, you know, if you only had the three times zoom, it'll still look far away. I know you want to make sure that video is up close for you to see and, and show your family and friends. And then you have the slow motion uh, modes. You hit the button one more time. The uh, camera will go over into its slow motion mode. Uh, again, that's 720p resolution and then um, at 120 frames a second. So okay. it's, uh, like I said, a few more bells and whistles, uh, but the camera, like probably the biggest feature on it is going to be the Wi-Fi. You have the modes, which is pretty cool, but the camera has a built-in Wi-Fi antenna. So what that allows you to do is if you're out in the tree stand and let's just say you just smoked a buck at 20 yards, but you're like, oh man, I, I really don't know if I made a good shot. You can actually turn the camera's Wi-Fi on and then pull out your smartphone. There's a Tacticam app you download off the app store. It's free. Mm. Uh, it's called just the Tacticam app is all it's called. And you hook your camera and your phone up together. Your phone will uh, respond to the Wi-Fi from the camera. And uh, you just log in, click whatever camera's connected, and it'll let you replay that footage or any footage that's on the camera for that matter. It'll allow you to go back in and have that instant replay ability. So you can go back in, you can watch your arrow, you know, fly all the way down to the target. You can pause it so you can really see where you hit the deer, that kind of thing. Plus you can actually save the videos right to your phone, maybe text your buddy who's over in the next tree stand over. So you can just show him what you just did. So uh, it's really, really cool. It allows you to instant replay Um, on the 4.0. You can use your phone at that point to remote control the camera. So there's a few, you know, things you can do that way. I know we have some pretty cool um, footage of guys, you know, they'll put them down on a deer trail. It's, you know, pretty heavily traveled. They'll be up in a tree stand 10 yards from it and, you know, be remote controlling the camera with their phone and a deer will walk right over the top of the camera or whatever. We've got some pretty cool things that happen that way, but, um, yeah, just, uh, just another thing you can do. I know a lot of, um, you know, dads and moms who are taking their kids out for the first time, I've heard them really like that feature for the same concept. You know, the kids got the camera on the gun or the bow and they're sitting there, watching live what that camera is doing because it live streams to the phone as well so wow. okay. um, anything that camera's pointed at yeah you're getting a first-hand look at exactly what the camera's seeing so they get to kind of watch as it happens plus they get the video to show everybody else it's pretty neat gotcha so the the tacticam solo doesn't have that but as soon as you jump to the 4.0 that's where the wi-fi capacity gets into play yeah okay. and we're actually we're getting ready to uh to do some stuff with that too so i, I did mention the bone collector edition that's out yep um you can find those in, in some retailers and, and things like that but the um or get involved with your conservation organizations we have a lot of those guys that use those as well but the tacticam bone collector solo does have wi-fi built into it so once uh once we get all these things up and running hopefully all of our cameras are just going to have the wi-fi Wi-Fi as an option because it's so popular. Again, you know, we don't want a guy to necessarily have to jump that huge price point if he can't afford it just to get the Wi-Fi. So 
um, it does allow the, any hunter at that point to be able to have that Wi-Fi instant replayability. But yeah, the, the standard solo does not, the, the Tacticam Bone Collector solo does, but the 4.0 series is where the bells and whistles and the Wi-Fi uh, definitely kick in. Okay. And do all of these have the low light resolution capacity or does that jump up once you get up to the higher levels? Yeah, they all do. Um, your Tacticam solos, it, you're limited because you don't have the option to adjust the the low light capability with your frame rate. So um, for, for low light, and I'm sure every hunter out there that's watched a hunting TV show has heard one time or another, oh, we ran out of camera light. And so your eyes, our, our eyes are pretty magnificent. We'll be able to pick up light typically a lot longer than any electronic version that tries to mimic right. the human eye right. will be able to pick up. And it all depends on your lens and everything else. So um, when you're talking for a point of view camera, our cameras do extremely well for a point of view camera in low light. Uh, the Tacticam Solo, it's got a built in um, 60 frames a second, which is okay for low light. But what you're going to run into is you're going to be able to definitely film out to the last 15 minutes shooting light in just about every every situation. The biggest difference it's going to be is if you're hunting in the timber and it's pretty, you got a pretty uh, heavy canopy, not allowing a lot of light in, that's where you're going to start to run out of that camera light. Now, if you're sitting on the field edge, Depending on cloud cover and that kind of thing, there's a good chance you'll be able to film past legal shooting light just with your tactic team solo. When you go up into the 4.0, the low light uh, sensor in that is quite a bit better. Um, it definitely it helps out in, in the real low light situations, but what you're going to be able to do with a 4.0 is adjust your frame rate. So um, that's kind of where the different modes play a little bit more of a factor too. So in your uh, three time zoom 2.7K resolution mode, that's at 30 frames a second. So um, for those people who don't know, um, everything on a, on a camera is based off frame rate because it's, it's the term motion picture comes from the same, the same thing. So what it's doing, is taking 30 pictures every second, which when you watch them in sequence is where you get the video effect, right? Right. So 30 or 30 pictures a second leaves that aperture open a lot longer than 60 frames does. And a lot longer than 120 frames does the shorter amount of time that that uh, apertures open taking pictures means less and less lights getting into the camera. So if I was anybody and I've got a Tacticam 4.0, I always switch mine, even no matter how far my shot might be, I always switch mine to the green mode. That way I'm at 30 frames a second. I'm getting the best low light capability that I can. Um, if you, if you've got it hooked up to your phone, you can actually adjust for an even slower frame rate. Um, but as soon as you shut the phone off, it, the camera reverts back to its initial setting. So, uh, that 30 frames is going to be your best. And then your, uh, but with like a, that muzzle loaded deer, I was telling you about's a good example. So I ran out of camera light in the, uh, cause I was back in the timber a little ways and the deer was standing in the field when I shot him. Well, that muzzle flash coming out of the barrel at three feet in front of that camera was enough to like light up the camera. Like you see the muzzle flash, even though it's a pitch black picture, you know, you're listening to the deer walk in. Um, and then I was able to actually track him with my flashlight it's pitch black outside. It was a cloudy night. So there's no light coming in. I've got my Tacticam 4.0 on my head and I've got a flashlight and I'm following his blood trail through this field. And you see exactly on a black screen, you're, you're looking at the ground where my flashlight's lighting it up. And that works out to about, depending on the power of that light, I've got guys that send in all kinds of uh, predator hunting videos now with red lights. I've seen a fox get shot at just about a hundred yards um, coyote hunters, you know, depending, again, depending on what kind of light they're using and, and its power, it'll pick up whatever lights available, even if it's pitch black, which is really, really cool. Then you jump into our 5.0 and the low light sensor on that thing is ridiculous. We were out, uh, testing it with some, we were out setting trail cameras actually on one of Jeff's hunting properties. And, uh, there were some deer out in the field. They're about 50 or 60 yards away from us. And it was getting to the point where you're kind of seeing silhouettes, you know, more than anything with your naked eye. We got home and we were just playing with the cameras, kind of seeing what they would do. We get home, we plug them into the computer and we're watching and the camera was actually picking up more light than our eyes were, which was pretty, pretty wow. darn outstanding, especially for a point of view. Yeah. So with my 5.0, I don't think I'd question its ability to get you out past legal shooting time. So right. that'll definitely be a cool factor wow. for everybody. That's intense. So jumping from the 4.0 to the 5.0, now that we just talked about how it, it picks up higher low light uh, capacities. Mm -hmm. What else is different between the, the Tacticam 4.0 and the 5.0 and the and also the wide lens between the yeah. two 5.0s? Yeah, so your 4.0, um, like I said, it's got the built-in features. You've got, your, you've got your standard mode, you've got your zoom mode, you've got your slow motion mode. You go into the Tacticam 5.0 and it's got all the same things. So it's going to operate just like the 4.0 does. You're going to see the same lights, same colors. Uh, each of the modes is going to kind of be a similar feature. 
The difference is where you can actually customize your modes now to do whatever you want them to do uh, based on your hunting situation. And you've got the Tacticam 5.0 remote as an accessory option, which is really, really cool. So when you're looking at your modes in the 5.0, you jump up from 2.7K in standard mode to 4K in standard mode, which, you know, again, for the tech guy, you know, everything seems to be moving in that 4K direction. Uh, you know, for the average Joe, 4K is cool, but I just don't think, I, I think it, it could potentially just because the ability of the camera is, it, it's going to slow your camera down if you don't know what you're doing, just be, and it's going to be tougher to edit, tougher to watch on your phone, on your computer, because everything's got to be built to run that speed. So uh, for the tech guy, like I said, who's out there editing and stuff, it's a great feature. You can zoom in pretty much infinitely and it's not going to get blurry on you, that kind of thing. Um, but it's cool for the guys that just have to have 4K and plus it helps us to compete with our other competitors that are out there. Um, so you have your 4K resolution. You've got your uh, eight time zoom now instead of the five time zoom that was in the 4.0. And the neat, neat thing with the uh, 5.0 is I can actually adjust, I can custom adjust whatever zoom I want it to be. So if I want one mode and one time zoom, I can go all the way down to one time and then I can bring it all the way up to eight on my next mode or whatever. So you have the eight time zoom that's customizable. And then your uh, third mode is your slow motion mode. That's now at 1080p. So it's actually in high definition in slow motion at 120 frames. But then you also have the ability to customize that to a super slow motion in 240 frames a second, which mm -hmm. is really, really cool. So uh, like I said, just all the modes that we have are upgraded. And then when you're connected to the Tacticam Wi-Fi and you hook it up to the Tacticam app on your phone, any of the modes that it's in, you can actually customize them to be whatever you want. So uh, let's say my green mode that would default to 4K at three times zoom. I can hook it up to my phone. I can drop that resolution down to 1080p just because I personally know I'll never need 4K for what I do with it with my editing stuff. And then uh, maybe instead of three times zoom, I want it at six times zoom. So I can toggle that up to six. And maybe that's the perfect setting I need for whatever I'm doing. Let's say deer hunting at 40, 50 yards. Um, but then I know I'm going to need a long range version because now I'm out in Montana. I can shoot with my rifle out to 200 yards. I'm going to want to, you know, have an eight time zoom mode at 1080p resolution and, uh, or maybe 4k, whatever I can do that. And then my slow motion mode, I can set it to 240 frames, uh, you know, just for some really cool footage if I have the opportunity to get it. So again, the customizable or custom uh, ability for the 5.0 is really the biggest advantage over the four. And then the increased zoom, I would say is probably the next biggest, um, microphones the same and all that, but the, the other selling point is the remote. So the remote actually comes as an accessory. It doesn't come with the camera okay. and you don't need it to operate the camera. All of our cameras, like I've said a few times here is one button, push the button on the camera. It's going to come on and start recording in whatever mode you have it in. But with the remote, I can do this at a distance now of 30 yards. I can set the camera out 30 yards away from me, maybe facing backwards if I'm in a ground blind. And I know the deer is going to walk between me and that camera. So now I can get two angles, one on the backside, one from the blind on my other camera, and I can turn them both on with my remote. I don't have to be right on top of the camera. I don't have to, you know, maybe I'm in a situation where I can't move. The deer's got me pinned down up in the tree. You know, I've got my wide camera facing me and my other camera facing down. Well, instead of missing it, I can, you know, if my hand's in my pocket or whatever, I can hit the button on the uh, remote. Both cameras come on. I don't have to worry about it. So it allows you, again, to control up to five cameras uh, with one remote. So you can turn five different cameras on. They're going to come on and start recording at the same time, which for guys that video edit, that just takes one step out of your, your editing sequence is trying to sync up the different angles you had. If you're using tactic cams, all your angles are going to be on at the same time and start recording at the same time. So that's pretty neat. So how many, how many cameras at the same time can you turn on? Up to five. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the, so if you've got the moments upon you and you can just boom, trigger, <laughs> boom. Okay. Now. It's on. We don't know where exactly what angle we, we need to hit, but we've got it covered. Exactly. Yeah. And I know uh, Ben, actually, Ben Stern, the guy who invented the camera, he just got a pretty solid deer video. And I think he had four cameras running or five. He had one on the ground. He had two up in the tree above him. He had one on his bow and one facing back at him on his bow. And uh, yeah, just with the remote, he had them all five running. He actually got a really big buck, which was wow. pretty cool up in Wisconsin. Gotcha. And then you said that the... You use the wide lens for fishing mm -hmm. more often yeah. than not. Is there any other applications to the wide lens for the 5.0 that I mean, it has all the other features of the 5, but does the 5.0 wide lens have any other capacities that you can think of? Oh, absolutely. So what I would, you know, if you're going to have, um, you know, I guess for argument's sake, if you're going to, you can pretty much film all the point of view cameras now that Tacticam's out, you know, all this stuff you would need 
to put together a small production for TV or YouTube or whatever. That wide lens is going to give you the ability to film um, that up close stuff without kind of making you motion sick. So um, with the camera design, you know, again, the whole premise behind TAC cam, it's built from the ground up for the hunter. So what you need in a lens design compared to other point of view cameras is the ability to mimic your human eye. So everything's real distance and, and you got to get that real depth. Otherwise it, it makes the footage unusable, you know, if it's past 10 feet. Yeah. So with the wide lens is optimized for about 30 feet and it makes it nice because I can hold that camera and do a self interview. If I'm doing something, uh, you know, just kind of hold it at arm's length and it's going to look perfect. It's going to have me just the right distance from that camera. Uh, obviously all the audio with the microphone ability, it just allows you to kind of have a second angle that um, you can do up close and personal stuff with. Maybe I'm setting trail cameras and I want to, you know, film myself setting up my trail camera, setting up my mock scrape, whatever I can do that. I can get a bunch of B-roll with it. So for my purpose, my favorite thing to do with it outside of fishing is actually have a selfie view. So if I've got, you know, one camera, my regular lens camera mounted facing forward on my scope, on my muzzle loader, or on the, um, you know, um, stabilizer slot on my bow, I can actually mount another one either facing backwards on the scope or backwards on my bow riser. And I can get my, like I said, I can get my whole facial expression and all that because it's like, it, it pushes me enough away from that camera to just be the perfect distance. I can see most of my body plus my facial expression. Um, I know we've got a couple really cool videos out there this last year of a, a guy who took his daughter on his first on her first muzzleloader deer hunt and just watching her face light up every time that deer would do something before and after the shot, you know, it was just kind of priceless to have. Um, but it gives you multiple angles is really the benefit for if you're going to use multiple cameras, it gives you one angle that you can use for just about anything. And then your other angle that's optimized for the shot. Um, now fishing, like you said, I like it because it, it opens the picture up a little bit too. So you're seeing about 130 degrees versus about a 90 degrees um, out from that camera. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm kayak fishing again, you know, if I, if I've got a fish coming in on the opposite side that the camera's pointing on my head, on the head mount, you know, I don't have to really crank around and really focus on where my head's pointed to make sure I'm getting that footage. It brings it up. It shows the whole front of the boat. Yeah, you know, I can see on both sides of the boat pretty well. Uh, there in Virginia, did a lot of offshore fishing with a couple buddies of mine. Um, again, it just it captures a lot more of the action. You can see just a lot more of that stuff in there. And it allows things that are more up close and personal, like fishing, when you're holding that fish up at an arm's length, you get to see the whole fish up in the picture versus maybe it looking like you're looking at the fish's head and body. Gotcha. All right. So the wide lens is good for the close up stuff. Is that, am I yep. hearing you right? All right. And then, yeah. yeah. The simplest way to put it. Yep. It's, it's better for close up stuff. Yep. Okay. And then the, the five O is good for the, the longer range zoom stuff. Exactly. Got yep. It. Got it. Okay. Well, let's take a coffee break. And when we get back, we'll continue our conversation with Aaron Stonehawker from Tacticam. I still can't believe that's all you're taking. I got everything I need all in one bag. Rackology Deer Supplement and Attractant, developed through years of intense scientific research, comes a product that puts it all in one bag. Superior Attractant, scientifically formulated vitamins and minerals, and all at a much better price. To get yours today, please check out Rackology.org for a list of dealers. Rackology, how can you afford not to use it? Everything deer need, all in one bag. Hunter-friendly coffee retailers are great, but ever wonder where they buy it from? Now there's a company that imports directly from farmers. Zero middlemen roasts it and ships it right to your door. From the farmer's fields to your morning cup, Hunter's Blend Coffee has been in the hands of hunters. Through their giving, your coffee supports the RMEF, Whitetails Unlimited, and Women's Hunting Associations, and many others. Now you can defend hunting one cup at a time. Not bad for a cup of coffee. And did I mention, it is so good. And now back to our conversation with Aaron Stonehawker of Tacticam. So you have one of these devices and they're awesome, but you can't, they're not effective unless you have a place to put it because you're, you have to tend to your weapon, right? Yeah. So yeah. How, talk about some of the, the ground mount strategies. Like you said that I think Jeff had one on the ground um, and then obviously you have other places that they need to go, uh, whether it's on your weapon and there are different types of weapons, obviously that they need to uh, accommodate, um, mm -hmm. and maybe a head mount and what, you know, where would you put the, that, that mount, um, or, or how would you mount something that is, uh, of interview type quality, that close up shot for a wide lens. 
Yeah, definitely. So we, we've got mountain or we got mountains, we've got mounts for everything um, that you can probably think of for the hunter. So uh, we've got our custom gun mount that'll allow you to mount to gun barrels. It'll allow you to mount to scope tubes, whatever, anything that's round, it's going to allow you to mount your camera to that, uh, which is really cool. Um, then you've got your Tacticam bow stabilizer mount. This is actually made to replace a bow hunting stabilizer, but it doesn't have to. So uh, on my competition bow, for example, I've got a about a 12-inch octane stabilizer on that that's got counterweights on the end. So I can do a couple of things. The mount plus the stabilizer is about seven and a half ounces, so I can actually just pull my weights off, throw that in the end. Now my camera's sticking out, you know, 12, 12 to 14 inches in front of the, the bow, but, you know, it also, you know, kind of compensates for that weight that I just took off. Or it's a tubular-shaped stabilizer. I can actually use my gun mount on that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the average Joe, it's just got a hunting stabilizer. That's what our stabilizer mount is made to do. It's made to pull that one off, slap it in there, and it mounts it right to the stabilizer slot on your bow. Um, there's a couple of custom mounting options that you've got. Uh, so our head mount actually comes with a universal adapter mount. You can buy it separately uh, online as well. But that mount adapter allows you to mount Tacticam to any – pretty much any other third party uh, mount that's out there. When GoPro started the point of view, you know, popular stuff, they made mounts for quite a few things and then companies came in after them and made mounts for everything. So uh, with that universal adapter, all those mounts use the same base system. So really there's a mount out there for any application you could want now that you've got that adapter for it. Uh, We do have a head mount. Like I said, that universal adapter comes with that if you buy that uh, as a package. So um, it's a basic head strap. It's got one strap that goes around your head, uh, another strap that goes over the top for stability. And then you've got a th- complete 360 degrees of adjustment, um, you know, when you can rotate the mount to whatever angle you want. And then you've also got the the tilt in and out to about 180 degrees for slow on that camera. So really, and this is where the Wi-Fi kind of helps out with that as well, because there are states, uh, Montana being one of them, actually, uh, that during an archery only season, it is actually illegal to mount electronic uh, pieces of equipment to your bow, no matter what it is, even if it's just a camera. Really? So, yeah, yeah. And so, well, I think the way I, the way I read it is that once you attach any kind of electronic piece of equipment to it, other than a lighted knock, which just got past this last year, I guess that you can use lighted knocks. Um, the camera, or the bow becomes something other than archery equipment. So, if if it's gun season, the way I read it, I think you can have it mounted to your bow if you want to hunt with a bow during gun season. But obviously, you got to abide by the gun season laws there as well. Um, but yeah, so there are states like that. I know Oregon was one that just got it passed this year. One of our Tacticam team members, actually, really cool side note, uh, Riley Miller is her name, give her a shout out. Um, she met with uh, some of those decision makers this last year uh, quite a few times, and they just switched it to where you can have a camera mounted on your bow up in that state. Um, so really, really cool opportunities kind of happening now that there are more places and cameras are getting more popular for people sharing their hunt. Um, but yeah, the head mounting way, getting back to the mounts, uh, it's completely 360 degree adjustable, uh, with the Wi-Fi, which is what I love the most about having that head mount is when I'm fishing. That's always what I have on. Uh, and now when I'm archery hunting, I'm gonna have to figure this out as well. I can hook it up to my phone and I can see exactly when it's live streaming to my phone, where that camera's pointed. So I can make sure it's adjusted perfectly for capturing the angle I'm trying to capture. Gotcha. Okay. And then you've got, uh, our crossbow. We, um, for crossbow hunters, depending on what kind of scope you have, um, a lot of them are getting really compact. So you're losing that scope tube space that you normally have been able to mount your gun mount to. Uh, now we made an under scope rail mount that'll mount to Picatinny rail systems for under scopes. So it kind of kicks the camera up and off to the side of your scope, but it mounts underneath the scope on the same rail your scope's on. Um, then we've got our, our normal Picatinny rail mount, which will mount, and either one of those will mount to any Picatinny rail system you've got. So you've got an AR, you got a, a pistol, you know, it's got the Picatinny rail underneath the barrel there. Um, you can do all kinds of things with it. So really, if, if you've got a weapon, we've got a way to mount it to it. And then if you are trying to, like you said, for that wide angle, if I'm trying to film a self-interview or something, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a tripod here with a camera arm on it. And I can actually just get my universal mount out. And I've got a little, uh, I bought one of those 30 packs for like 15 bucks on Amazon of just the random mount bases. And, uh, and now I just kind of use whatever I can um, with that universal adapter to mount my wide lens to it. So if I'm trying to film like a little interview, put it on a tripod. Um, if I'm doing it on my bow, I've actually got a just random a custom mount that I mounted to my riser with that universal mount. that has got the camera pointed back at me, uh, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a way to mount your camera for any application you have. Okay. All right. And what about your, your ground mounts? How would you do that? So it just kind of depends on what you're trying to do. I know those, you know, those, uh, there's, they got those flexible leg tripods that are, yep. they, I think they stand at, at full 
height, about seven inches off the ground. Yep. A lot of guys do those. I know we've got some really cool turkey footage of, of guys having cameras out on like right next to decoys or waterfowl footage where guys have them out in the, in the decoy spread facing up where they just throw a wide lens on it. So you don't have to worry about it being all that up close, or if it's pointed up, you're capturing more of the sky and then they'll be filming off their gun barrel from a blind or, or whatever, you know, shooting the geese and ducks or shooting the, the turkey, but the turkey is right up on top of a camera and doesn't even know it. So those flexible tripods are a pretty uh, cool option. They give you a pretty, you know, pretty universal function when you're trying to mount it on the ground, or maybe there's a tree branch that's lower than you that you want to mount it to that kind of thing. That's probably the most popular one. Gotcha. And how would you mount it to that? Is there a, a an adapter or something that would make it yes. attached to, to the it is, itself? Yeah, exactly. So the tripod, almost every single tripod mount has got, they're typically universal. It's got a thread on it that you just would screw a mount into, or you screw the base of a camera into. Yep. So what you do there is, like I said, in that little 30 pack of mounts I have, I've got one that is that standard thread size. Uh, it's a tripod mount is what it is. And so I would just thread that base on there and it's got those two prongs sticking up. So then I take my universal adapter mount off my head mount. And I stick it on there and then I've got my, now I've just got my camera mounted to my tripod. Gotcha. Okay. And let's say you had like a regular tripod. Does that stabilizer mount that you have, it has a, mm -hmm. uh, a thumb screw at the bottom to hold it in place. Yeah. Is the thread count and, and design of that thumb screw the equivalent to what you would find on a standard tripod type structure? No, that's actually going to be a little bit smaller, but I love that idea. Actually, that's uh, that's pretty brilliant because then you could just have your um, your stabilizer mount as your tripod mount or that. That would be really cool. Plus, you know, it's keeping the camera completely upright. So, right. no, that thumb screw down there. Um, now you mentioned that. So, yeah, it's uh, to hold the camera in the stabilizer mount. It does have that thumb screw on the bottom. So you just gotcha. snug it up when the camera's in there, loosen it up to slide the camera out. Right. But, yeah, no, it's, uh, that would be cool. But, no, it's too small. Gotcha. All right. So that's not the same fit as you'd find on um, a standard no. screw. And I, I don't know what the fitting uh, size is. Like there's, there's a, a number that's associated with it. I don't know what it is. But, yes. Yeah, I can't remember either. Yeah. Um, but I actually have – One kind of – I have, I have one of the, I have the device that makes that like, it, you know, you can get a piece of metal and you can uh, hone out your exact screw fitting that fits most game cameras and, and other tripod accessories. Yeah. Uh, I could see how just a simple change in that in the stabilizer mount would be huge. Cause then you wouldn't have to, you know, the thumb, that, that, that screw mount itself would become your thumb screw. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That'd be, um, That'd be a pretty cool option as long as you had a yeah a screw to throw back in there when you, if you wanted right. to use that same stabilizer on your bow. I know we do have guys uh, that'll mount them inside of race cars for like dirt track racing and stuff. Yep. And uh, one of the companies that we've been working with on some of that stuff, it, they actually take that stabilizer mount just because of its rigid, rigidity. Mm -hmm. They um, they drill a hole through their roll cage and they put the the bolt on the back end of that stabilizer through it. And, you know, put a bolt or a nut on the end of that. And that's actually the mount they use for kind of pointing down inside the car, which is kind of cool. Gotcha. And so the, the screw end of the stabilizer mount where you'd screw it into your bow. Yeah. That, yeah. that part could, if you could hone out or, or uh, create the, the hole uh, that would fit the thread, you could technically screw that in to any place as long as you could get it to, to fit your, what the standard bow mounting is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, what other accessories do you feel are important, um, to go along with some of these things? So the one thing that the camera is not going to come with, um, to film right out of the box is going to be an SD card. So, um, that's probably, you know, for, again, for people who aren't super familiar with cameras, your SD card is the brain of that camera. So, when you get an SD card, you want to make sure it's the highest quality SD card you can get. You're probably going to want to make sure it's the highest uh, capacity that your camera can take. And what those two things are going to do is allow that camera to run smoothly and store the maximum amount of footage on that uh, card before it fills up. So um, this really comes into play with the 4.0 and the 5.0 because they both have higher resolution options, which takes a little bit more for that camera to write. And so that card needs to be able to write pretty darn fast so it doesn't jam the camera up because it's trying to shove information into a little file uh, and if it can't do that fast enough it can back the camera up 
So that's probably the biggest thing our customer service line probably handles is SD card questions or, you know, some of the ex uh, experiences that a person might be having with their camera is being caused because of the SD card they have in the camera. You swap it out with a higher quality one, the camera goes back to work and fine. So um, on your Tacticam Solo with a 1080p resolution built in three times zoom, uh, just about any SD card that's out there, as long as it's rated for a class 10 is going to be, uh, is going to be fine for you. I believe those ones will take from eight up to a 32 gigabyte card. Um, your 4.0s are going to take anywhere from an eight gigabyte up to a 64 gigabyte card. I run 32s in mine. Um, but again, you're going to want to make sure that it's running a class 10 as a, from the quality standard, because that allows that 2.7 K footage to write cleanly. Um, you can go a little bit better and get like what's called an ultra one or an ultra three quality. So, uh, class 10, just side note on that. It's going to be, if you're looking at an SD card in the package and it's rated for class 10, it'll either say class 10 on the package, or it's going to have a symbol there, which is the letter C with a 10 inside of the, the C that'll be your class 10 symbol. And then an ultra one or an ultra three is going to be the letter U with a one or a three inside of it. So okay. just those are the two things people are going to want to look for. When you get into the 5.0s, you're definitely going to want an ultra three card. Again, that's just that right speed with the 4k, the file size of a 4k video uh, can get pretty darn big. And uh, even if you're filming it, it doesn't mean that your computer is going to want to accept it when you open it up. Um, on your computer, if your computer can't read that file size or your phone, same thing. So uh, there's a bunch of different factors. The, the more um, the more resolution you have, the larger the file size. That's where these other factors kind of start to come to play. So SD card is your biggest accessory. It's going to make sure your camera's running smoothly. 5.0 definitely get yourself at least a 64 gigabyte card um, that's rated an Ultra 3. It'll take up to 128. Um, 4.0, definitely make sure it's a class 10. Uh, better is the ultra series of cards, but make sure it's a 32 or bigger, I would say. And then your uh, your solo, you're going to have no problem from an 8 to a to a uh, 32 gigabyte card with a class 10 on that. Um, okay. But you're just, it, depending on how, many, how much you're going to store on there is where the other stuff gets into. So, you know, if you got an 8 gigabyte card, it's going to fill up pretty quick. You're going to get maybe an hour and a half, maybe maybe longer, depending on what you're filming on that but not much more which might sound like a lot but you get a few 10 minute clips on there too and it'll start to bog the camera down so um definitely go with a higher uh, higher capacity card higher um higher class card to make sure your camera's running right gotcha okay so i mean and that's super important it sounds like this is something that you do, yes. do not want to overlook because the yep. the, the higher resolution cameras are taking up more uh, bandwidth basically and, and with exactly. the cards and you're going to have to have a certain kind of card. Are they all micro SDs or are they just standard SDs? Yeah. Yeah. They're all micro SDs and okay. we actually sell them on the website too, just to kind of, it's, it's as a, a convenience factor, I guess. Um, just so people know they're getting the right style card for their camera. We sell the 64 gigabyte um, class 10 cards on there. Uh, they run great. I, that's actually what I'm running right now. Um, but yeah, just the higher quality of the card you put in there, the better it's going to run. It's like your computer. It's the hard drive uh, for that system because right. the, the camera is essentially a tiny computer. Gotcha. So if you really look to get super sharp images and, and do some really high end videography uh, with the Tacticam, then you're going to need some of these heavy, more heavy duty uh, SD cards. But if you're doing the solo or the, the 4.0, you may not need to go as big if you're just trying to capture moments for yourself. Exactly. Okay. Yep. All right. That's good to know. That's some, some big details there. Very yeah, good. Like I said, that's uh that's probably the most common thing that we get, especially, uh, you know, especially with these 5.0s and that's something we're kind of expecting. Uh, the more tech stuff you, you cram into something, the more uh, potential or perceived issues, I guess people might start to have with it because uh, that, window for user error comes in and it gets a little bit bigger, but the, the SD card is, I can, uh, I can already tell you from the five windows that are out there, people are calling with different issues or thinking their cameras are having issues and it's, it's the SD card. So right. don't cheap out on an SD card. It's the most important part of that camera. Okay. Very good advice. Now, as, as far as the warranty now, mm -hmm. and this is always a big thing with me when I buy anything that is electronic, what's oh, the, absolutely. what's the warranty policy? Yeah, so all of our cameras come with a one-year warranty on them that, uh, you know, that it covers your mounts, that covers your camera, anything you bought from Tacticam that covers. So, um, you know, if, you, uh, if you're out there and your back cap cracks or, um, you know, you might be having issues with your camera that the customer service determines, hey, yeah, go ahead and send it in. We'll take a look at it. 
Um, they'll cover that. Uh, pretty much anything on that camera, head to toe, it's covered for at least one year. And then we do have an extended warranty you can buy after that as well. I've never seen um, personal experience before I worked for Tech Cam or even now. I've never seen customer service uh, not usually cover something as long as it's pretty well within that one year window on the first run. If you buy the extended warranty, it's a two year warranty, I think, for 60 bucks. But, you know, you're making a $500, close to $500 investment on your 5.0 or even that $200 investment on your solo. You want to make sure it's covered. So right. um, we've definitely got you covered in, in the camera. I've got my 2.0 still that I've had now for four years and I it still runs and kicks and everything. And I have put that thing through hell. So okay. uh, <laughs> they're, they're covered and they're rugged. So you don't really have to worry too much. But if you had an issue, we've got you covered. All right. So speaking of price points between the solo 4.0, 5.0s. What, what should we expect? Yeah, so the solos start out, uh, the standard solo starts out there at $199, um, which is kind of the same price one our 2.0s were. And then uh, you jump up to $329.99 for the Tacticam 4.0. And then the 5.0, um, our latest version is $429.99. So it jumps okay. uh, about $100 in between each one. Gotcha. All right, very good. I think that's a pretty good overview of what the Tacticam was, is today, and what is available at the highest level for anybody listening, um, is there anything else you want to add to that? I mean, just uh, if you're looking for a, a way to film your hunt or you're just getting started, uh, and even now, uh, you can pretty much film anything you need to film with a Tacticam, which makes it really cool. Uh, one of the – my favorite part about it, I guess, coming from myself as a guy who's – I've filmed with the camera arms up in the tree and, and a DSLR camera and a regular uh, Panasonic camcorder. I've, I've done quite a bit of that stuff, too being able to leave an extra 20 pounds of gear at home and take six ounces up in the tree with me, it's, it's night and day. That's my favorite part uh, about just the capabilities of this camera are endless because you open up so many more doors. You're, you're going up with less weight. Uh, now that I'm out here hiking around in the mountains, I can tell you, I don't want to drag around a big camera. Right. Uh, first off, I don't know the opportunities that are going to present themselves and when. So having something that's a push of a button is super important for me. It's got all the audio I'm going to need. It's got the two angles I want. And uh, and like I said, I'm bringing less than a pound of gear up there with me. So even if I have five cameras, I'm still under a pound. So um, pretty pretty solid that way. That is a Super nice, simple, it's, weatherproof, yeah. everything. That's a super feature. And it's not something that should be overlooked is that if you're if you're going for a, a decent walk either to your tree stand or if you're just if you're a ground hunter like like I am especially when mm -hmm. there's snow and we're doing tracking it, oh yeah it it means the a huge difference between how little you pack that in just your essentials and the weight can mean a big difference absolutely yep. and then then bringing able to uh, to bring that memory home with you is that much cooler Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so one last question, and this is for our, our Northern folk. Yeah. How, how sensitive are the batteries and the functionality of these things to cold weather? To cold weather, you're going to, any electronic, you're going to lose some battery life uh, when it comes to cold weather. Now, depending on the situation, um, you know, it could be worse than others. I've been out uh, personally, well, I've been out with uh, my Panasonic camcorder and I had to switch batteries three times on a four hour hunt. And that was, I think the it was about 10 degrees outside this last year in uh, Virginia. I think we had it down to, it was five degrees. One morning I was hunting with my 4.0 and I got, we had four or five ducks we ended up shooting at and I got all five of those on camera and then we were out there for about three and a half, four hours as well. Uh, I got down, it drained about a half a battery, but it didn't burn up the whole battery, which was nice. Um, and then uh, I've been out there in negative two degrees on, a, on another duck hunt out there in Virginia um, and again, we did actually didn't end up seeing anything that day, but we had, you know, birds work us and the camera would come on. So I had probably five, 10 clips over another half day period where the morning was negative two. And I think it only got up to about 10 degrees. Um, so I was able to capture some footage there, you know, not shooting at anything, but the cameras definitely come on and respond. So, and again, that actually another, that's a coming back to that SD card, the higher quality your SD card, the better it's going to be able to write in cold weather. Cause everything slows down on electronic when it's cold, everything. Um, so when it's filming and trying to write, you want that high quality, high speed SD card to be able to write even better in cold weather too. So that it, you'd be surprised how many things can get, uh, seem like an issue when it's actually just one piece of the equipment. So gotcha. SD card, SD card, SD card. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So what, where's the future of Tacticam going? I mean, I know you said you can't really tell us all the little details, but <laughs> 
about the future and some products that might be coming out. Can you give us a hint on something? Give us. I can you give want. you some hints. Yeah, yeah. I'll see. I'll, maybe I'll get chastised for it later. But no, we uh, uh, the the near the nearest future. Well, the coolest thing with 5.0. I'll start here. Um, the 5.0 with the software ability that's in it, and just like the I guess the quote unquote computer that's inside of 5.0. Uh, it's got some pretty outstanding capabilities. So it's going to, you know, for guys who might be worried about, you know, punching the bullet on this investment of, of a camera that's four twenty nine ninety nine, dollars uh, you know, and thinking, oh man, you know, I bet next year, like, like Apple or iPhone or whatever, they're going to come out with a new one. Uh, that's not going to be the case. So guys that may be worried about that, the cameras we've got out now, the solo, the 4.0 and the 5.0, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, all, all three cameras, I would, I would recommend any one of those cameras, anybody that's just trying to film their hunt, you know, based on the situation is where I might uh, recommend the upgrade. But with this 5.0, uh, things are going to get pretty darn cool, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple of years here as we're able to do more stuff with the camera and put more rollouts to the customers, things like that. Um, I, I really am excited about the opportunities that are there and, and kind of the, the ability to expand the camera we have versus coming out with a new camera to expand on its capabilities is pretty neat. Um, I will say that we've got something else that's coming in here probably this next year or so. Uh, that is going to open the doors wide open to every single type of hunter out there. I know, you know, guys listening that, um, you know, maybe they're rifle hunters out in Wyoming that antelope hunt and the closest shot they're going to take is 200 yards. You know, maybe they're concerned about the distance this camera can film. There's going to be a lot of cool things that are going to open a lot of doors for that type of stuff. Um, we've done a lot of research. We've got a lot of guys in our Tacticam team program. We've got a lot of guys that, uh, utilize them for fishing, especially with this wide lens. So I would be looking for some pretty cool fishing stuff to start uh, rolling out here pretty soon um, that maybe open some more doors for fishermen. Just being able to, to kind of uh, widen that perspective. And then the 5.0 now, uh, one of the features we didn't touch on is it's actually got a red dot mode hmm. that you can put it into. So you go into your camera, uh, open it up on the app in your settings, and you can turn on a red dot. And what that does is when you go back and replay the footage, the camera in the center of the screen has actually got a, a little red dot, just like what you probably imagine. And what that allows you to do when you're uh, maybe you're out sport clay shooting or maybe you're waterfowl hunting and you're missing birds all day and you're like, what am I doing wrong? If you have that red dot feature on, you go replay that footage, it will show you a reference point of where your gun was pointed in relation to the target, which right. is kind of neat. Oh, that's so shooting neat, yeah. sports is, a, is another thing we're starting to try to target a little bit more. Um, you know, especially at a lot of our conservation partners like Pheasants Forever do a ton of stuff uh, with youth shooting organizations and trap shooting, uh, you know, stuff in the high school level. Uh, so we're really looking to maybe get into some stuff there too. Gotcha. Have you ever thought about exploring some of the 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 night hunting for coyotes and, <laughs> and uh, hogs and that kind of thing, where you can the the infrared sensitivity um, or yeah. you know the the heat sensing type stuff? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a huge question. We get that a lot, actually. Uh, you know, how do you guys you know are you ever going to come out with a night vision one? Um, the, the possibility is there. I'll say that. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know what. Uh, capabilities, I guess the the guys, you know, in development, Ben and those guys are looking into making the camera do, but I will say that I, with technology nowadays, uh, it wouldn't be a difficult task to make that available. Yeah. Um, I do know they've got there, you know, that's the thing with the outdoors industry. I think for, uh, it's kind of like the military for every product you see uh, on the shelf somewhere, they there's 10 other ones that are improving on that in the works. So um, the constant improvement, constant development with features like that, I, I don't think they're definitely not out of the question, but I don't know if there's a timeline on that yet. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Uh, Aaron, let's move on to a deer hunting story. I know that I asked you to think of a good one that, that uh, might be very <laughs> memorable to you uh, in the beginning. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's uh, tell us a good deer hunting story. All right. Well, I'm going to, I wanted to tailor this one kind of to the topic today. So um, as I told you, you know, I've got that uh, Light to Power Door stuff. It's a website now, so I'm, I'm trying always to get videos put together for it. But in the infancy of that, you know, when I first started getting my camera gear, um, you know, I was, you know, you're always out there, you're trying to make it work. But when you bring, and you listen to anybody that videos their hunts, when you bring a camera, not so much with Tacticam, but when you bring a camera arm and a full-blown camera into the tree with you or a cameraman, hunting gets twice as hard. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of things that got to fall into place just right. You've got to do everything just right. You've got three times more, you know, stuff out there that you're actually trying to worry about make happen and all that. So, uh, the first time I, I, I videoed several deer hunts, but I want to say I ever videoed one until this time. So 
I'm going out there. Uh, it's Thanksgiving morning. It was like five degrees, I think, when I woke up. And I, it was one of those days you walk out and you're like, man, I might just stay home. You know, the family's coming over at noon. Uh, maybe I won't go. But I ended up putting on every uh, piece of hunting gear I had. And I figured, oh, if I'm not warm in this, I'll go sit for at least an hour. And if I can't uh, do that, then I'll end up coming home. So I packed the camera arm. I packed my big old Panasonic uh, camcorder out there and uh, get everything up there. I go to my one of my just honey hole stands that, you know, worst case scenario, you're going to see a doe walk by. And, uh, I'm sitting up there, got the camera going. I filmed a little interview when the sun came up and all that. And, uh, I, I just, this was a, an off day and I didn't know if it was cause it was cold or what, but the deer were not moving. I hadn't seen anything. Uh, it was working on 10 o'clock in the morning and I'm starting to get cold. You know, I'm like, okay, my feet are getting cold. And once your feet are cold, it's over. So, I'm uh, I'm standing up in the stand, and all of a sudden, it's out of nowhere. I literally was getting ready to pack that camera off the off the uh, the camera arm and start getting all that gear back in my pack. And here comes a doe walking over the ridge, and so I was like, you know what? Um, let's go ahead and try it. So I I turned the camera on, and I'd already swapped batteries I think twice at this point. I turned the camera on, and I look at the battery indicator on the screen. And it's already flashing like low battery for my third battery. Right. And I'm like, well, if she, if she comes in quick, I'll get her. If not, you know, no big deal. But uh, she ends up coming over the ridge just perfect. She stops right at my 20 yard tree that I, it's my 20 yard marker tree for that direction. Yep. She stops right behind it and I'm at full draw with my bow. And I look up, I glance up at the camera screen. She's dead center of the shot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. <laughs> I pull the trigger. I smoke her just perfect shot. She kicks, she runs off and she dies on camera, everything. And I'm like, wow. holy smokes. Like this couldn't have worked out any better. I was so pumped. The, uh, that was the first time I'd ever got a deer on video and I'm like, okay, this is, you know, now I'm, now I'm excited. I actually made it happen. And, uh, so I flipped that camera around and I'm doing a little excited interview and stuff. And then I, I flipped the screen over so I could see myself to make sure I was centered. And I noticed, uh, there was no red dot up in the corner of the screen. I'm like, that's weird. And so I, <laughs> I hit the record button and, you know, to pause, thinking I'm pausing the camera and I turn it back around and I look and the lights flashing now. Mm. And I flip the camera back around to myself and I'm like, did I not get any of that? And, uh, <laughs> sure enough, when I get home and watch the video, the only, the only thing I captured was me saying, did I not get any of that? Oh, and man. so I could not believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, the first time everything just worked perfect, you know, right. and I was freezing and everything. So anyway, I go take care of the deer and I'm a little bummed, but oh, well, I got, you know, I got some meat for the freezer and, uh, it's a funny story if nothing else. So pack everything back home. And, uh, I didn't have a successful deer on video. So then now we're going to go to another hunting story. So this last, uh, when I moved to Virginia, um, I, I, I was still an Iowa resident at the time. So I actually came back and I got to come home to hunt. So my uncle's funeral and my brother-in-law's wedding were happening back to back weekends. And so wow. we stayed, we took a week of vacation for that week in between. And, uh, I'm like, man, it's, it's October. I'm not going to go back and not bow hunt, you know? So I bring my bow with me and we get out there to the stand. And this was the first time that I had had with a bow in my hand with my tacticam on, on a hunt. And I, I, same thing. I just bought my any sex tag. I said, I don't care what it is. You know, I'm putting meat in the freezer. I'm taking meat back home to Virginia. Cause I still hadn't got a chance to deer hunt out there at that time. And, uh, we get out there to the stand and doing a little interview stuff. This time I, I have a little bit different camera to, to save some weight. I bought a, a small DSLR. And I've got that up there in the stand with me and everything's kind of looking good. There's some, you know, bucks fighting behind me that didn't end up working out, but I go out back out that evening and, uh, I just, there's a whole herd of those that just come charging in. It was really cool. So I got this all on film with my DSLR and I had my bow hanging there. I'm like, they're coming running that hard. There's gotta be a buck chasing them. So I'm waiting and I'm waiting and these deer are just acting funky. And I mean, I've never seen does act almost like they've got a really bad case of ADD. Like they, they run one direction and stop. Yeah. And they sniff and they mill around and then all of a sudden they're sprinting over here, sprinting over there. I'm like, dude, something's up. Like something's coming. And so I'm getting ready. I got my bow ready and all the deer, they take off and they jump off the edge of this Creek down into a Creek bottom. They splash around in there and they go run up the other side. And I'm like, where is this buck? Like he's got to be chasing them through here. Yep. Well, then I'm watching this. Uh, there's a cedar sapling that I, I just happened to start seeing it move. And I look over there and there's a buck just thrashing it. I can't see him. I can do He's on the opposite side of the tree, but he's just tearing this tree up yeah and then i get excited so i get the camera on that and i get my tacticam on and ready and i'm grunting at him and i'm 
uh, snort wheezing at him. I'm trying to get him to do something. He just will not work. He's focused on this tree. Well, the buck ends up staying on the opposite side of the creek, which isn't normal for that area. He works his way all the way around me about 80 yards. And I don't know if he caught my wind or what, but he just beat feet, got out of there. So I'm like, okay, this hunt's over, you know? And so I just, I turned around. Well, there's a doe with two, they look like yearlings with her. And she was about 50 yards from me. And so I just, I got my, uh, I got on my, I've got a, a butt call that's got like the bleat and everything on it. I bleed at her and just out of pure curiosity to see what she would do. And she like walked onto my tree and she came sprinting from 50 yards over a Creek all the way up to the base of my tree, like in two seconds. And I've never, I don't know if she was the lead doe and she wanted to pound whatever I was or what, but so at this point I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get a doe. So she works her way around this brush. I have no shot opportunities. I get the main camera on her. And I've got my tact cam still running and she, uh, she kind of works out and I've got one arm on the camera arm and I'm working it, working it, working it. All of a sudden she looks up and just nails me. And I'm like, Oh crap. Like picture perfect scenario. You know, she's right there in frame and I've got the camera on her and everything. And she, but I, she locked onto me moving up there. So I froze and she started kind of doing her head Bob thing. I thought she was going to blow me and she ended up looking away at to see that the other two does are doing at that point. I'm like, screw the big camera. I've got the tact cam. We're going to make this happen. So I get my release on the bow. I've got the tech cam pointed at her and she looks back up at me and then she looks down for a split second and kind of walks behind this tree. So I go to full draw. She comes out. I level her at 10 yards and I put a perfect shot on her. She takes off running and just out of dumb luck, I kept the tactic cam on her. That I was so excited because I thought, okay, now I officially got my first year on tactic or on, on camera period, you know, and uh, I while I'm squatting down, like looking through the trees and stuff, my bow just happened to follow the direction she was going and stayed on her the whole time. So I got to watch her fall over on the camera and get back home. And it was, it was the reason I think that if you're going to be filming at all and you want to get that shot on camera for, if you're hunting a TV show or you're just an average guy looking to get your hunts on film, that, that right there sealed the deal with me of why tax cam is such a cool and important tool. If you're trying to film your hunt is, she would not let me use that big camera. I would have not been able to harvest a deer that whole trip if I had was only relying on that camera, trying to get it on camera. But with my tactic cam, I was able to just leave it on her and smoke her and put some deer in, in the cooler and take it back to Virginia. So right. um, just uh, a cool testament, I guess, to why it was important I had a tactic cam on right. it. Right. I agree. I, I think that I think the, the size of a tactic cam and the, the hands-free capacity, if you still want to capture that video – it's crucial. Yeah. yeah. No, the, those are, yeah, I figured those, those stories would fit. I know uh, you're probably used to the big buck registry, big buck stories, but both of those uh, didn't have horns, but I do have my biggest buck today. If you got time for one more, I, All right. I can do it. Sure. Let's so, do it. So I might as well write for the big buck registry this time. So yeah, anyway, let's, my, let's uh, get a big buck story in there too. <laughs> so this was way before tactic. And this is actually the second deer I ever harvested with my bow. Uh, my grandpa had just passed away from cancer um, that week. And so I kind of went out there and, um, you know, just, I, I told myself, you know what, if nothing else, I'm going to spend some time out here in the woods and just kind of remember grandpa and, and think of him that way. And you kind of just got that sense. You just felt like, you know, he was kind of out there with me in the stand that morning. Um, and it just, it was a beautiful morning. The sunrise was beautiful sitting in my stand. And, you know, I really wasn't, I don't think I was focused on the hunt so much as just actually taking some time to really enjoy just being out there in the middle of nowhere, quiet to myself, you know, kind of remembering some things. And, uh, about the, you know, about the time I could start to see my pens, I started hearing movement off to my left. And so I, I look over and I can see the back of a deer kind of moving through, um, some gooseberry bushes over there. And so I'm like, okay. You know, so I kind of, I ease, I ease up in the stand and I get my release of my bow and I put my grunt call, call in my mouth and I, I just let out one little grunt. And it was a doe. She picked her head up and she's looking around and she puts her head back down and keeps on feeding through there. And I'm like, okay, that was kind of cool. But you know, this early, it was, it was November. It was rut time. I'm thinking, okay, there's, there's probably a buck with her or there will be soon. And sure enough, I just took a look a little bit farther around my shoulder and I can see another back. This one's about twice as tall as she was with its head down and it was just trailing her perfect. And so I grunted again and I just see this rat come up out of the gooseberry bushes. And it was a little too dark to really tell exactly what he was because the sun wasn't filtering through where he was at yet. But I just knew he was big. He was wide. I'm like, okay, like that's a <laughs> that's a monster deer. And so he kind of puts his head back down. And he starts trailing her again. And I grunt again. And he picks his head up and he looks. And he's he can't really figure it out. And he blows once, kind of snort wheezes. 
and then he kind of shakes his head and puts his head back down and starts trailing that doe again. And then this time the doe didn't even, she wasn't even focused on us. And so every time he put his head down, he did it about three or four more times. I would grunt. And finally he had enough. He got right in the sunlight. It was just the perfect backlighting. He gets up there and you could just see his neck get all fat and swollen and the hair standing up on his back and on his neck. And he just starts posturing like he's going to come kick something's butt. Wow. Uh, you know, this was, this was his doe and this was his area. And I'd never seen this deer before. And on one side at that point, I could tell there was something kind of funky with one side of his rack, but I was so focused on not moving because he, he pinned me down in the tree every time. Like he knew that's where it was coming from, but he, I don't think it was light enough. He could really see me in the tree yet. And so he, he starts circling around in the tree and he gets to where yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, being an inexperienced bow hunter at this point, you know, I was, I, I didn't even have a range finder. So every time I, I would just always try to estimate, you know, trees and different yardages. And so I'd estimated he was about uh, 15 yards based off where he was in relation to this fence post that was out in the middle of the woods. And so I, I keep waiting for him to give me an opportunity to draw. And finally he, he kind of had enough because I quit calling and I think he just like, okay, that buck must have left just based off what I did. So he looks back over his shoulder for that doe. And when he did, I came to full draw and he looked right back at me. And I let the arrow fly and I heard the loudest crack I've ever heard, you know, taking a shot. So I thought, huh. and he didn't move. He stood there. He just stood there and he kind of looked around for a second and he, he looked back at the doe and he looked back at me and looked back at the doe. And then he just put his head down to the ground and he walked off mm-hmm. right after that doe. And I was like, man, I hit a tree. Like there's no way I, right. you know, I, I thought I just missed and I couldn't believe it. The biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. So I'm sitting up there in the sand. I, I the adrenaline kind of wears off finally and the deer and, that deer and the doe walk off and they're gone for a while. And it was, then it turned into the best morning of hunting of my life. I mean, there was bucks everywhere, big deer, broken deer. I mean, just ridiculous. None of none of the bucks were coming into range, but I wasn't sure about that shot. If I'd hit him, I didn't know, I'm not going to take a shot at a buck now because I don't know if I just shot one. And, uh, so all these bucks were working, I mean, right under my tree, it was crazy. Like I've never seen rut action like that. And a doe finally comes through the area. So the doe that had come through obviously was the hot one, but another one came in. She stopped 15 yards. Perfect to my left. I'm like, I've got a doe tag. I'm going to, I'll fill the freezer, you know, that way I can at least bring home some deer. And I shoot at her and I miss right over her back and she stands there. And so I load another arrow. She lets me do that. And I draw and I shoot right under her belly. I've got one arrow left. I'm like, well, I got nothing to lose. I shoot for whatever reason, 15 yards shot right over her back again. And she finally had enough. She took off. So now I'm up there. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. I have no arrows left and there's still bucks moving. They're all over the place. I'm like, this is crazy. So I wait about another half hour. I'm like, you know, I, I, I can't not spook a deer. I've just got to get down. You know, I, I have no arrows. I need to go see, you know, where my other arrow hit, find it in the tree or whatever. So I get down and I'm over there 15 yards from my stand looking for my three arrows. I find two of them and I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm looking. I cannot find this third arrow. And I bend over to move some brush cause I, and I found the arrow. I pick it up. And as I look up, there's a buck. He, had, he was missing one eye and he had, I think, three or four times busted on one side and two or three busted on the other. Like he had been fighting the heck out of some stuff. And he is eye to eye with me at like three feet, just staring <laughs> at me, like stopped on the trail wondering, what are you doing? And I just, I'm like, this is it. Like, this is where I die right here. These are the stories that you hear about. I had dope pee on my boots and everything. I'm like, Oh great. Like, here we go. Right. And I got so nervous. I started shaking and he kind of looked at me and started tilting his head side to side, trying to figure out what I was. And he finally blew and I could feel his breath on my face. He blew and took off running. I'm like, wow. Holy smokes. Like this, I'm never going to experience a better day. Like, you know, and I, I missed the deer, but whatever, like, that's so cool. So I go back up to my stand. And I climbed back up now that I got three arrows. I'm like, you know what? I'll wait here for another 20 minutes. It's just too good of a day. I'm not going to go home yet. And I get up there and I get all situated again. And I start seeing a doe coming down the trail towards me. And all the action kind of thus far hadn't been, typically the deer travel the opposite direction on that trail. But this doe was coming back down this direction and or towards me, like head on. So I start watching her. Well, behind her, I can see a pretty big body, but I can't make out what it is. I just know it's a big deer. I'm like, okay, a buck's following her too. Hmm. Uh, you know, I'll just wait here and let him let him walk on by, and we'll be done for the day. And she ends up coming right down the trail. And as she gets to the point where uh, you know the, the trail kind of turns and it comes directly at me, about there's about 25, 30 yards. The other deer that was behind her walked off the trail to the left and went behind some bushes. I never saw it. Well, that's when I knew it was a buck because there was a dried up Creek bed and they always drop down in there to travel through that area. Yep. And they usually end up, if they do that, they pop up behind the stand where you can't shoot them. 
And, uh, so she walked right underneath my stand perfect. And then I, I never saw him come out. So I'm like, okay, he dropped out of that Creek bottom disappeared. So I gave him about another 15 minutes, didn't see him. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going home. So I get down and I walk over to, uh, where the buck was standing that morning. When I went to shoot him, I don't see any hair. Um, I don't see any blood and I can't find my arrow. Like my arrows nowhere. And I look in all the trees in that area. I look at the ground. I'm, I'm not fine. I'm like, dude, I don't know what I hit, but that arrow either went sailing some other direction or what. So finally I give up looking for it and I go hop back on the deer trail and I start walking out and right where I saw that deer step off the trail back behind the bush laid the biggest buck I've ever seen in my life. He weighed well over 300 pounds. Wow. And, uh, he ended up scoring a 145 and he's got a, a seven inch drop time on one side. He's, um, I've got pretty broad shoulders. I like to think, but I can take, I don't remember what his inside spread is, but, um, I can actually take my shoulders and put them in his rack and move the rack around. And you know, it's, he's that wide. It's just a pig of a deer. Yeah. And I mean, I just started crying like instantly. Cause I was like, man, like grandpa was here this day. Like, come on. Like it just, there's right. no way that, and I've never had a day of hunting that was ever the same. And, um, but anyway, yeah, that was the, so I ended up, what had happened was I, I'd, I'd hit him in the shoulder. But my arrow, when I started gutting them and stuff, my arrow had penetrated the broadhead with the broadhead. And I think I probably had three inches of shaft that had gone into the deer and I only got one lung. And what he had done he, in the course of three hours, that doe took him wherever they went and actually brought him back around to die 30 yards from my tree stand. Wow. Uh, I mean, I would have never known I even hit him. There was no blood trail. There was no nothing. I mean, it was just, I was convinced I'd missed that deer. Right. And if that doe wouldn't have come back and for whatever reason, it took him that long to expire. Um, he, uh, he made it all the way back to the tree stand before he died. And it was, it was actually, uh, the taxidermist that I had him at end up, uh, kind of messing up some stuff and so i've had this rack forever just it never got mounted and i've always been hard on myself like i've got to kill a deer that was that big and had that same coloration to put that rack on it you know just one of those things the story's too good to to settle for something that's not him you know and uh i never have and then we moved to virginia of course and there's never going to be a deer big enough in virginia to <laughs> right. put that rack on you know so uh i actually ben stern a buddy of his does tax term and i didn't know they did it they do uh where he buys taxidermy and he sells the horns and stuff. So what he does, if, if he's got a mount that's in really good shape, he'll keep them out. And if someone wants, has a rack, they want to get mounted. You know what you're getting right away when you're looking at the deer, you know, you're not going to have to guess. And he just puts the rack on it for you. So I actually just sent that rack back two days ago um, to Ben to give to his buddy to put on a deer that I picked off his wall. Um, that's darn near good enough to, to put it on. But I figured I've waited long enough. It's been, right. I'm, well, heck I'm 28 now. And I shot that deer when I was 14. So, 14 years, uh, I've let that rack just sit there and now I figured it's time to put them up, get to Montana and we'll, we'll put them on the wall now. So what a great story. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Just yeah, amazing. A what a great story. Heck of a hunt. Very cool. Well, let me hit you with 10 rapid fire questions here. Yeah, let's do it. All right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Number one hunting tip. Uh, I think people are better when they first start hunting than they are when they, uh, when they feel like they're good at it. Um, so my, my, the reason I say that is I think everything that happened in that hunt, I just talked about, I, I think I was three times the hunter I was then because I was so picky about being still moving slow. You know, I wouldn't even dream of picking up a cell phone in the tree stand, you know, cause you, you're always looking, you're always alert. And then nowadays you get so relaxed with it. So I think staying, uh, number one tip, if I had to try to make that short, I think always be alert, always pay attention because you never know what's going to happen. Gotcha. And that doesn't ever go away, no matter how much you think you know about the area. Gotcha. We all have, I think I know the answer to this question. We all have these things that it drives us crazy if we leave it in the truck or at, at home <laughs> and we're out in the, the field. And if we don't have it, we just feel naked. What's that one thing for you? Uh, because it's happened a few times, I'd actually say my release, which sounds dumb. I mean, obviously, you're naked when you're a bow hunter, but I've actually done that. Yep. three times, I think in my hunting career, yep. uh, you know, if I had to say now for working for tax cam, it's, if you leave the tax cam at home or you accidentally leave your battery or you take your SD card out and you forgot about it, that sucks too. Yeah, that does. What's the, what's your, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Biggest pet peeve in life. Oh man. Um, bad leadership. Mm, that's a good one. That's a very good one. <laughs> we have not had that answer yet before. That's a good one. Well, uh, so I'm a big guy on leadership. So. There you go. Okay. Excellent. All right. You're 28 today. What would you tell the 16 year old Aaron Stonehawker, knowing what you know today about life? 
Oh man. Uh, probably just, if you ever feel driven to do something and do it, uh, and don't ever stop doing it. Don't ever, uh, don't put things on the side table, I guess, for later. Nice. Do them now. Okay. And keep driving at it. All right. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a stranger comes up to you and asks you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? I would say I uh, work for Tacticam. It's the world's greatest hunting camera. Nice. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, holy smokes, I haven't had breakfast yet. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Just realized, yeah, I'll have eggs now that you mentioned eggs. I always have eggs for breakfast. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, you get your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What would it say? Man, blank canvas billboard. Like picture or words? Anything. You decide. Anything. Hashtag life, life strategy something. <laughs> oh, shoot. I would say uh, keep your eyes up and, and keep moving forward. Okay. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Uh, probably my dad. Um, just because he's he's been my constant role model of uh, just, again, that, that solid work ethic. I think he's 100% where I got my work ethic today. And uh and just knowing he, he's the he's the definition of, of the American dream story of starting somewhere and making yourself or giving yourself the ability with the right mindset and the good work ethic to get anywhere. So yeah. he's definitely made a, a twice the life for me and my brother and my mom uh, than I think he had when he was growing up. And I, I want to be half the person I think I am today without him. So very cool. Very cool. What's a typical day in your life look like? Typical day in my life. So if it's uh, if it's a weekday, Monday through Friday and some weekends. Uh, I get up about 5.30, 6 a.m. Uh, my wife's a nurse, so if she's on shift, I'm um, helping her get ready for the day, cooking her breakfast, helping her get her lunch ready, that kind of thing, and getting her off to work. And then once that starts, if uh, I feel like it, I go to the gym and then get back here. Uh, I try to start my day usually about 8.30 uh, for work. So I get on the computer, answer a few emails. Um, we do a lot of stuff with conservation organizations, so I have a lot of phone calls during the day. I think I'm on the phone uh, more during the day, probably than a lot of secretaries or, or even maybe some call center people. So uh, a lot of, a lot of talking, as you can probably tell through this podcast, I'm a talker. Um, and then, uh, about five thirty or so I try to wrap up. I, I'm the cook of the house, so I really like to cook. So I usually have to start dinner then and the wife gets home, we eat dinner and, uh, try to go do something. Usually, uh, either go walk the dogs or go have fun doing something and then call it a night, but very cool. All right. And then finally, what's a deer hunting day in your life look like? Deer hunting day in my life. So, um, well, in, in Iowa, it would be getting up at probably four in the morning, making sure I always lay this stuff out the night before. So that, that accounts as the day, I suppose. So I, I try to lay myself out the night before, get up about 4 a.m. I've got a checklist on my phone of everything that I'm supposed to be bringing with me. I, I check that list off as I pack it. Uh, get out there. I always spray down when I get to the field. I spray the car down before I get in. And then I spray myself down again when I get out, go out there and just see whatever the morning brings. If, if it's dead, a lot of times I'll leave, um, leave the stand probably about 11, come back, try to come back one thirty, two o'clock. So I kind of get that evening hunt. Uh, when I moved to Virginia, the day was a little bit different. I figured that just the spots I had available to me, um, really, if it didn't happen by 7 a.m., it wasn't going to happen. So I stuck to night hunting more more often than not. So yeah. uh, usually I just go right after I got off work. I'd bring my stuff in my truck or, or the trunk of my car and um, spray it down, go sit in the blind, go climb a tree with my climber or whatever for a few hours in the evening. And that was actually the best hunting that I've I had out there. Um, and now that we're in Montana, I think it's going to be a lot of early mornings, a lot of a lot of long hikes and a lot of uh, just glassing and, and seeing what the country has to offer. Very cool. Excellent, man. All right. Those are the 10 rapid fire questions, Aaron. Cool. Man. Excellent. So if we've created more questions uh, for the listeners as they've been listening to our conversation about Tacticam and all the mm -hmm. features and bells and whistles that it has, where can people reach out to get more information? So Tacticam.com is going to be probably their number one resource. If you're looking for like videos or testimonials, that kind of thing, any of the video channels that are out there, YouTube, Vimeo, uh, we've got all kinds of other ones out there. Facebook's a great place to find videos. You will find more uh, videos that'll sell you on it than anything. And you can actually see real life customer, you know, videos of the stuff, uh, you know, how the tax can works, how it operates, what the footage actually looks like. So I think videos are going to be your number one resource. Um, if you need product information, tacticam.com, uh, anybody at tacticam, if you know somebody or we've got a, we've got a tacticam team 
of about 1,500 people that are all around the country that are a great resource for information as well. If you happen to know one of them, they're all over social media answering questions and stuff like that all the time. Uh, our local dealers as well. We do a good job of training our local dealers about our products. So if you happen to know your local, you know, big box stores, Shields, Cabela's, Bass Pro, um, those guys, they're all going to have them in there. They're pretty knowledgeable about our products or the mom and pop shops. You're, there's a good chance uh, one of your local shops close to you has got a tactic cam and they, they've been trained on the knowledge as well. So um, it's, you know, with what we have for our camera, product knowledge is key and, and we try to put it out everywhere we can. So tacticam.com. Uh, any of the video channels that are out there or your local dealer at the grassroots level is going to be your best uh, resource. Very cool. Excellent. Aaron, this has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I've really enjoyed talking to you about the product and your life and uh, your involvement with Tacticam and how you got started and how they got started. And uh, that the deer story was tremendous. <laughs> <It's> tremendous. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome I'm glad i got to share it publicly so that's pretty cool so thanks for coming thanks for on having me. yeah we're, we're yeah welcome. absolutely it's been a blast welcome back anytime all right thank you sir i appreciate aaron taking some time to go through all the ins and outs of the tech cam camera in the company and how it got to where it is today clearly they started out with just a prototype and some duct tape and put it all together and today they have a company that hunters look up to and and pursue that action camera probably more than any others so we thought we'd dive in to see where the company's been where they want to go and what products are out there because i'm sure there are a lot of you that always wanted one of these things but just haven't actually bitten this off yet so uh, hopefully you found that helpful next week we're going to go back to looking at an app and this time we're going to be looking at Deer Lab, which is a little bit more than an app. It explores your pictures that you've taken on your game camera and then organizes them in a way that data can be produced on deer movement, which is really kind of what we're all trying to figure out. So stay tuned for that. Uh, again, we're going to be talking to Deer Lab with John Livingston. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? I do have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Chubby Times to the Week is going to talk a little bit about the uh, pre-rut that's getting ready to come into to play in the whitetail woods here in the next few weeks. You know, we get into, I always say, like around the October 25th through the, the Halloween that you're going to see a little pre-rut activity. And, and what we see here in Ohio is that these bucks are going to start gorging on food. And, uh, you know, a, a food source is going to be a huge focal point for myself and a lot of other hunters that uh, have been out there and witnessed uh, the pre-rut activities. They're going to start really trying to pack on as many pounds as it can before this rut kicks off. Uh, Cause we all know once the rut hits, it's nonstop on the run for, you know, a solid month. And they try to really pack on as much nutrition as they can, cause they're going to deplete all their resources as far as nutritional, uh, as they started in the rut and chasing does. And it takes a really, really hard toll on their body, uh, once the rut kicks in. But, uh, also, you got to remember with the rut kicking off that uh, these, these bucks are going to run the does. And it seems like daybreak, it starts out in the woods, and then they lead out to a, some kind of either a CRP or a, a cut cornfield, somewhere that they can keep a good visual on the doe. They can keep a good visual out uh, for predators or hunters. So they go to them, a lot of times they go to them open fields, and uh, that's going to be a, a huge focal point for myself to, to get to the fields and uh, hunt the skirtings of uh, cut cornfields or uh, thicket where the, the deer are going to naturally push out so that they can keep an eye on their does and they can keep the, the predators and the, uh, the hunters in, in a visual sighting of anything that could bother them. They're, they're going to want to get out in the fields, and it gives them more room to run, chase the doe, wear her down, get her where she's kind of wore out where they can, uh, you know, put the fancy on her. So I started focusing on uh, tree stand placements along my field edges, and if you got uh, – if you got everything set up just right, I tell you, the rut can be really fun. But uh, it's so unpredictable once the rut kicks in what the deer movement's going to be. And you're going to see a lot of chasing, a lot of a lot of buck activity, cruising around, trying to find a scent trail maybe on a hot doe. But uh, with any luck, you'd be out there in the woods and uh, old Mr. Big Boy run right under you. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? 
Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you or you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice let's put it that way you can always listen to our show on other places as well not just youtube we're found on stitcher TuneIn radio iheart radio spotify google play and as an amazon alexa skill go to alexa and say alexa enable big buck registry and if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckredstreet.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. And that's a whole lot of big buck, Jed. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.